Hello everyone, and welcome. We are continuing our reading of the secret doctrine of the Rosicrucians as we explore life after death and reincarnation. We're going to be talking about reincarnation, but the most important thing that we will be discussing today is life after death. And this may be our final reading of the Secret Doctrine of the Rosicrucians. Most likely it will be. We'll see how fast we go through it, but we're getting near the end, so it will probably be the last one. If you haven't seen the others, don't worry. You can enjoy this one for what it is as we discuss this most important topic, reincarnation and life after death. As always, we're going to see how the Rosicrucians view it, as well as then examine it through Hyperianism and the lens of ontological mathematics. So for those who may be new to this channel, we are a revolution of the mind here to wake up the world and build a new humanity and a new earth founded on logic and reason so we can enter into a new stage of consciousness, what we call Abraxian consciousness, so that we can create a world based on logic and reason where there is equal opportunity for all so that we all may have the opportunity to grow, learn, and optimize. And we can understand a lot by looking at these old texts, but once again, we always examine them through the lens of ontological mathematics and logic and reason to see where they go astray or whatnot because they are intuitive and mystical rather than uh, purely rational. So we always want to, as I said, as I've said before, the top shelf is reason and the bottom shelf is intuition. And we always want to have logic and reason guiding the way so that we don't get mired in uh, you know, very crazy ideas. Because uh, recently I've, I've been coming across these spiritualist YouTubers, and I may do a video on them at some point, and they get a lot of interesting, they have a lot of interesting ideas. But it's like a dream, and they take everything so literally that they are going into really wild directions, crazy conspiracy theories, because they don't have that ground of logic and reason. This is why I say it's so important to have that so that we always have that compass guiding us so that we don't go off the rails and create you know uh so like these new age spiritualist types uh, it's really like a modern day fundamentalist religion just with different words so we always have to always make sure that we're guided by logic and reason anyway i'm really excited to get into this reading here we're going to get started this continuing our reading of the secret doctrine of the rosicrucians and this is starting metempsychosis, which is just another word for reincarnation or transmigration. It means the same thing. So basically, we're going to read this chapter here about metempsychosis or reincarnation, transmigration. And this will set the groundworks for understanding life after death. So let us begin. And remember, if you have questions, super chat them away and I will answer them. I'll take breaks periodically. The Rosicrucians hold as a very important part of the teaching of the occult doctrine of metempsychosis, reincarnation, or transmigration of souls, the essence of which doctrine is the survival of the individual soul after it passes from the physical body in death, and its re-embodiment in a physical body by rebirth after a sojourn in the resting place of the souls. So here... We're simply talking about reincarnation. The doctrine of metempsychosis, or uh, reincarnation, remember we can use these words inter interchangeably, metempsychosis is reincarnation, is one of the oldest of the human race. Traces of the teaching are found in the records of practically every one of the ancient races in all parts of the globe. In one form or another, it has existed in the esoteric circles to be found at the heart of each of the world's great religions, including Christianity. It has always been a cardinal doctrine in the religions of the Orient, and during the past 25 years has attained a wonderful revival of popularity among the thinkers of uh, the Occident. The Rosicrucians' teachings hold that the evolution of man has been accomplished not alone by the general evolutionary trend of the race by which it moves forward from generation to generation, but also by the advance and ascent caused by the improvement and the reincarnating individual soul, each step of rebirth tending upward and onward. As a writer has said, 
The teachings hold that evolution is caused by the soul striving, struggling, and pressing forward toward fuller and still fuller, fuller expression, using matter as a material, and yet always struggle. Okay, let me, let me, I want to say something real quick before we read this quote. So, it's really important to understand that in Hyperionism, that reincarnation has nothing to do with morality, it has nothing to do with karma, it's not being about a good person, it's not about sinning or not sinning or anything like this. What reincarnation is all about is about the optimization of the mind, and what they're saying here is it's about evolution, and that's true. So it's all about evolution. You are an eternal mind, known as a monad, which is a mathematical entity. And being a mathematical entity, you are in a constant state of trying to optimize your pattern to come up with a better and better, more optimal, more advanced patterns. Almost kind of think of it like a computer that's constantly trying to come up with the most advanced program that it can. It's like a computer that keeps updating its own software, its own operating system. So that's what a monad is. It's constantly evolving. And it uses the material realm to insert itself into this you know, so-called physical world that we call the Holos to learn, grow, and explore. And so the point of reincarnation is to have this opportunity to learn, grow, and explore. It's about evolution. It's about growth. It's about progress. So it's not about being a good or a bad person. It's not about karma. It's not about anything like this. It's about learning. It's about understanding. It's about evolution. And the material world is the medium through which a mind uses to explore, learn, and understand. Through our interactions with each other, we are able to learn much quicker. We can go to school, we can have teachers, we have life events that occur. All these things are aiding in our evolution and growth and understanding. And so the reincarnation process is nothing mystical or, you know, it's not new age woo or anything like this. It has to do with evolution. It's just mental evolution and it uses mat the matter to facilitate its mental evolution. So keep that in mind, uh, because this quote is pertinent to that. The teachings hold that evolution is called caused by soul striving, struggling and pressing further towards fuller and still fuller expression, using matter as a material, all right, using matter as a material, and yet always struggling to free itself from the confining and retarding influence of the latter. The struggle results in an unfoldment, causing sheath after sheath of the confining material bonds to be thrown off and discarded as the spirit molds matter to serve its higher purposes. Evolution is but the process of birth of the imprisoned spirit, unfolding and extricating itself from the web of matter in which it has been involved and enfolded, and the pains and struggles are but incidents of the spiritual uh, parturition. And I mean, you can see this as well, the different avatars that we have available for a mind to link to. You know, you imagine a mind linking to, say, a dinosaur. I mean, yeah, it can learn by linking to a dinosaur, but as the avatars, the physical avatars evolve, this also gives better vehicles for minds to explore that much greater. You know, imagine a mind linking to a house cat. Yes, it can definitely learn and understand, but look how much better it can learn and understand when looking to uh, linking to a human avatar. So minds will, uh, you know, depending on the optimization, the level that they are at, they will link to more and more complex organisms. And physical evolution is the uh, evolving of the vehicles for uh, the mind to link to. So evolution is not purely Darwinian in just that it's natural selection, but it's also teleological. It's also teleological. So you can imagine that we, uh, I mean, natural selection absolutely plays a part in it 100%, but it's not just that. It's also teleological. So I want you to understand that we are also evolving ourselves. Not only are we evolving ourselves, but we literally are evolution. We are evolution. 
Evolution isn't, you know, it is done to us in a certain degree, but now as we come to self-awareness, we can control our own evolution. So I want you to imagine in a time in the future when we can create, when we will be creating new avatars. So imagine sort of like a biological, technological hybrid, or maybe even some kind of virtual, virtual avatar that we could create to facilitate a monadic link. You see, it's no longer just uh, natural selection or survival of the fittest, but consciously being shaped by us. We are consciously and teleologically creating avatars. And once we have this Abraxian consciousness for the purpose of uh, having better and better vehicles to host a monadic link. So we are evolution. It's not purely natural selection. As you can see, we will be able to be the creators of our next avatars if we step into that new world of, of Abraxian consciousness. So let me, uh, let's continue here. But first, let me jump to the comments real quick because I see that Cynthia Keys super chatted $50. Thank you so much for helping us wake up the world. Uh, you are awesome, Cynthia. So let's send... Let's send some uh, try, sk try skills in the chat. Try skills in the chat for Cynthia. Thank you so much for helping us wake up the world, Cynthia. And all your support means the world to me. While I'm here, I'm taking a look to see if there's any comments. Mal Hobbs says, Buddhists believe in evolution and reincarnation. Yes. Yes, they do. But Hinduism, Hinduism and Buddhism... Uh, look at reincarnation with regard to karma so it has nothing to do with karma karma is a karma is not only a very ill-defined concept but it is a dangerous concept as well because some people will use karma as a way to justify the ill treatment of someone for example let's say that a woman gets uh, sexually assaulted some people will use karma to say oh well she must have been bad in a past life so she's getting what she deserves also in the Hindu system uh, reincarnation can also be used in a negative way with their caste system which has sort of like a ranking system where certain people are born into a certain caste and one of these castes is uh, castes is called the untouchables and they're treated very poorly and can only have the worst jobs and they can't break out of that cast uh, which is a very uh, dangerous way of thinking so uh, it's very important to understand that karma has to do with mental uh, I'm not sorry not karma reincarnation has to do with mental evolution and optimization mathematically and rationally and uh, not the ill-defined concept of karma it is possible that perhaps we would be able to recast karma in a strictly ontologically mathematical way, but we would have to completely change the definitions and make sure it's very rigorous and do so in a way that everyone knew what we were uh, talking about when speaking about it. So um, for how, how karma is right now, it can be a very dangerous subject and it's one that Hyperionism rejects. Julian says, I stopped Buddhism because I felt it was against my carnal nature, but I learned a lot. Yes, I think that that is absolutely fine. Um, I think that's great. I think that you that's great that you were able to learn something from it, but then realize that it was missing some things and then move on. That's what a lot of these, you know, systems, they're, they're, they're much better than fundamentalist religion. But ultimately, they are lacking things and they are detrimental to your growth and optimization and progress. So it is a great thing to be able to see, you know, take something from it, but then move on and realize that, OK, there are there are some major flaws here. Uh, Buddhism's major flaw is uh, detachment and the denial of the self. Detachment and the denial of the self are some of the major flaws in Buddhism. Uh, which keeps you, ironically, from enlightenment. Life is not about detachment and the denial of the self. 
it's about affirmation and self-actualization. It's actually the exact opposite. We don't want to try and diminish and step away. We want to step in and expand. We want to be the most powerful versions of ourselves and constantly be uh, expanding ourselves, expanding our influence, expanding our power as both an individual and a collective. We are the universe and we want full, total, complete and control over ourselves, which means the universe, because that is what we are. This is our world, this is our realm, this is our universe, and we want to step into our power and claim it for ours because it is what we are, rather than trying to step back. Someone said, See, someone says karma is just action and reaction, but that's not true. That's not how people define it. They don't define it as just action and reaction like causation. They, they, they usually use a moral action and reaction. So it's not just action and reaction like one domino hits another and it falls over, but it's usually defined in, ter in, in moral terms, such as this person was bad in a past life, so, the, so therefore the reaction w will be something negative will happen to them in a future life. Uh, which is very which is a very dangerous way of thinking. Which is a very dangerous way of thinking. Um, someone says it would be nice to believe in universal justice, otherwise the universe seems unfair. Well, the thing to remember is that we are the universe. So there is no universal justice. There is no universe. We are the universal justice. So we have to create a just world. We are the universe. This is what I want people to understand and, and I want to get this across because people always look at the universe as something outside of them. Like, oh, the universe will provide or the universe will, will cause justice to happen. No, we are the universe. So we will provide for ourselves. We are the saviors of ourselves and we will create a just world. We are justice. We are uh, creation. We are destruction. We are all these things. The universe isn't like God. It's not something to like, oh, well, that person was bad, so God will punish them. Do you see how a lot of these new age systems and things like this just replace God with the universe? Instead of, oh, God will punish them, it's, oh, the universe will, you know, they'll, they'll get their karma or the universe will, no, we are the universe. We, it's us, it's us. Please, please, I beg of you, stop looking outside of yourself, okay? Please stop, stop that. Don't look outside of yourself. We are the universe. And so we will create a just world. We will create a just world. If you don't, other people will create an unjust world, like the rich elite 1% have done. And so we, we want to reclaim this world as ours, because it is ours. And that's why we need this revolution of consciousness, so that everyone steps into a Braxian consciousness and realize that this is our world, and that we need to create a just and new world. Uh, let me see. Gregory Bell, thank you for helping us wake up the world. And Claire G, thank you so much, Claire. Claire has super chatted a hundred dollars. Thank you, thank you so much. Let's Claire. Claire, you're you're amazing. Let what what shall we send? Let's send. We're talking about a new world. Let's send the sign of new Terra for Claire. Thank you so much, Claire. And we'll do a color change for you. Let's do let's do purple. I like that. Let's do purple. That's for you, Claire. Thank, again, thank you so much. Uh, this is how I'm able to do my work. Very appreciative. Yes, let's get those. Let's get those signs of new terror going for Claire. I'm going to turn down the light just a little bit because... Does that work? That works. Yes, excellent. I love it. So let's continue. I love seeing all those hashtags. Hashtag MMM. I love seeing that. Triple M. Triple M. Remember, if you're on Facebook, come on over to YouTube, subscribe, hit that like button. And let's. Okay, so I digress. I digress. Uh, I have a feeling there's going to be uh, quite a few digressions in, in, in this particular video. But let's continue with our reading of the secret doctrine of the Rosicrucians because I want to finish it today. I don't know if we will, though, but let's see if we if we do. So, we're talking about reincarnation, which the Rosicrucians call metempsychosis. 
Excuse me. The Rosicrucians have no special distinctive theories concerning metempsychosis, but on the contrary, accept the general teachings of the ancient occultists concerning re-embodiment of the soul. They regard rebirth as just as natural as birth, and consider that the race has at its disposal a vast amount of actual experiences of individuals which conclu conclusively prove the truth of the doctrine. In fact, the Rosicrucian teachers make no attempt to argue the question with the student, but rather present the teaching as it comes to them, backed up by the wealth of authority on the part of the ancient schools and fortified by the innumerable personal recollections on the part of individuals. In most cases, the student himself has no intuition of the truth of doctrine. In the first place, and often has a greater or lesser degree of recollection of his former lives on earth. Metempsychosis has always been the accepted belief of many of the most intelligent members of the, I believe they meant to say race here, it is founded to have been the inner doctrine of the ancient Egyptians, yes, it's very, yes, and was held in the highest regard by the great thinkers of the ancient western world, such as Pythagoras, very, very true. Empedocles, ah, Empedocles is one of my favorites, threw himself into a volcano. Uh, Plato, Virgil, and Ovid. Plato's teachings were filled with the doctrine. The Hindu philosophies are based upon it. The Persian Magi held implicitly to it. The ancient Druids and the priests of Gaul taught it. Traces of the doctrines are found in the records of the ancient races of the Aztecs, the uh, Peruvians, and other old peoples of the New World. The Eleusinian Mysteries of Greece, the Roman Mysteries of the Temple, the Inner Doctrines of the Kabbalah of the Hebrews, all were based upon the doctrine of metempsychosis. The early Christian Fathers, the Gnostics and Manichaeans, which are amazing by the way, the Gnostics are fantastic, and other early Christian sects, they're uh, believed in it. The Gnostics are, are nothing what, like what, what you know Christianity to be. They're uh, blasphemous Christianity. Highly recommend looking into that. The great philosophers, ancient and modern, treated it with respect, if indeed they did not fully accept it in many cases. The following quotations from modern authorities give an idea of the importance attached to the doctrine by modern thinkers. And real quick, thank you to Scarlet Meadows for helping us wake up the world, it says, can you please do a video on all the new age stuff going on and prove it wrong? Yes, actually, I've been considering doing that, and I may do that very, very soon. If you guys would like me to do that, I've been thinking about maybe if I should actually do videos to maybe even like spiritualist YouTubers and do sort of a reaction video or like a breakdown where I watch them and, and, and break them down and show where the logical fallacies are and, and things like this. So if that's something you'd like to see, let me know in the comments. But continuing our reading, Hedge says... Of all the theories respecting the origin of the soul, metempsychosis, remember, that's just reincarnation, uh, metempsychosis seems to me the most plausible and therefore the one most likely to throw light on the question of the life to come. James Freeman Clark says, it would be curious if we would find science and philosophy taking up again the old theory of metempsychosis, remodeling it to suit our present modes of religious and scientific thought, and launching it again on the wide ocean of human belief. But stranger things have happened in the history of human opinions. Professor Knight says, If we could legitimately determine any question of belief by the number of its adherents, the decision would be in favor of metempsychosis rather than to any other. I think it is quite as likely to be revived and to come to the front as any rival theory, Professor Brown says. It seems to me a firm and well-grounded faith in the doctrine of Christian metempsychosis might help to regenerate the world, for it would be a faith not hedged around with many of the difficulties and objections which beset other forms of doctrines, and it offers distinct and pungent motives for trying to lead a more Christian life and for loving and helping our brother man. So basically this person is saying that reinserting reincarnation into into Christianity would 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 help it out. Uh yeah, I mean, I would like to see Christianity reformed into a version of gnostic Christianity. Fundamentalist Christianity is abhorrent, but if it could be reformed into a version of gnostic Christianity, that would definitely be a step in the right direction. Uh, let's just skip ahead a little bit here. Uh, 
Sir Walter Scott once made the following observation in his diary. I cannot, I am sure, tell if it is worth marking down that yesterday at dinner time I was strangely haunted but what I would call the sense of pre-existence, a confused idea that nothing that passed was said for the first time, that the same topics had been discussed and the same persons had stated the same opinions on them. The sensation was so strong as to resemble what is called a mirage in the desert. Why is it that some scenes awaken thoughts which belong, as it were, to dreams of early and shadowy recollections, such as the old Brahmins would have ascribed to a state of previous existence? How often do we find ourselves in society which we have never before met and yet feel impressed with a mysterious and ill-defined consciousness that neither the scene nor the speakers nor the subject are entirely new, nay, feel as if we could anticipate that part of the conversation which has not yet taken place? So th there's a number of, of reasons this could be. This could be indeed you possibly having a recollection of a past life or tapping into the collective unconscious. If evidence of the truth of metempsychosis, reincarnation, other than personal intuition and glimpses of memory of past lives were needed, we would find such evidence in the phenomena of infant prodigies and cases of childhood genius, instance of which abound on all sides. Children at a very early age manifest evidence of a deep knowledge of mathematics, music, art, etc., even in the cases where the explanation of heredity fails to fit the case. The case of Mozart gives us a typical case of this kind. The child, Mozart, at the age of four, was able not only to perform difficult pieces of music on the piano, but also to compose original works of merit. Not only did he manifest the highest faculty of sound and note, but also an instinctive ability to compose and arrange music, which ability was far superior to that of many men who had devoted years of their life to the study and practice of music. The laws of harmony, the science of commingly, commingling tones, was to this wonderful child not the work of years, but a faculty born in him. Another marked case is that of Zara Colburn, the mathematical prodigy, whose feats attracted the attention of the scientific world during the last century. In this case, the child under eight years of age, without any previous knowledge of even the common rules of arithmetic, or even of the use and powers of the Arabic numerals, solved a great variety of arithmetical problems by a simple operation of the mind and without the use of any visible symbols or contrivances. He could answer readily a question involving the statement of the exact number of minutes or seconds in any given period of time. He could also state with equal uh, facility the exact product of the multiplication of any number containing three, two, or four figures by another number consisting of a like number of figures. He could state almost instantly all the factors comprising composing a number of six or seven places of figures. He could likewise determine instantly questions concerning the extraction of the square and cube roots of any number proposed, and likewise, whether it was a prime number and capable of division by any other number, for which there is no known general rule among mathematicians. Ask such questions in the midst of his ordinary childish play, he would answer them almost instantly and then proceed with his play. This child once undertook and completely succeeded in raising the number 8 progressively up to the 16th power. In naming the result this incredibly long number, he was absolutely correct in every figure. Uh, so we just go on here. I want to kind of get through this. Just They're talking about this child prodigy who was able to do all these intricate mathematical details. Solve all these mathematical problems. And he could say that he did not know how the answers came into his mind, but it was evident from watching him that some actual process was under way in his mind and that there was no question of mere trickery or memory in his feats. Moreover, it is important to note that he was totally ignorant of even the common rules of arith arith arithmetic and could not figure on slate or paper even the simplest sum in addition or multiplication. It is interesting to note that the fact that when a few years later he was sent to the common schools and was there instructed in the art of written arithmetic, his powers began to vanish and eventually it left him altogether 
and he became no more than any other child of his age. It seemed as if some door of his soul had been closed while being while before it had been stood ajar. So let's get into here we get into some more important details. The Rosicrucians teach that the human soul is on the path of progress, learning the lessons of life and experience. All right, this is the same as Hyperionism. We as monads are mathematically optimizing entities. And so you could call this, yes, a path of progress. A path of progress. Learning the lessons of life and experience, life after life, and storing away the essence of these impressions which go to form the basis of the character of the individual when he is reborn. And this is also, let me let me point out that this is why another reason why we want to create a new world. Because we want to create a world, right now, this world does not offer very much optimization for us as souls, as minds. Because you're distracted by the rich elite 1% in creating a capitalist world where you are forced to work a 9 to 5 job that sucks all of your energy away and then you're so tired when you get home you probably just want to sit on the couch and watch Netflix or something. So this world does not offer you the experiences and the opportunity to learn, grow, and optimize. This is why we want to create a new world that removes all these terrible elements, all these confining elements that are literally preventing you from evolving, and instead create a world that gives us all the opportunity to learn, grow, study, create art, experience life, experience each other, experience our world, grow, travel, learn, advance in the sciences and mathematics, and all these different opportunities that will be given to us. Because right now there are none. So this is this this is just why this is another reason why we want to create a new world because we want to create a world with the maximum amount of opportunity for a soul to have experiences and acquire knowledge. And do you see how see the ancient Gnostics thought that the material world was hell and that the evil creator, the Demiurgos Yaldabaoth would take souls, divine sparks, from the realm of the Pleroma, the realm of the divine light, and use it to power matter, power his infernal creation. And in an analogous way, we see that happening today. The rich elite use your souls, your soul, to trap it and power their world, to run their machine of just churning out production and only benefiting them. So do you see how they have taken over the role of the Demiurgos? They are Yaldabaoth. They are the ones who have trapped souls here and are powering this world according to their world will. But in contrast to Yaldabaoth, we want to step into a Braxian consciousness and create a new world it is geared towards not the enslavement of souls, but the optimization and liberation of souls. We want to create that world. Each soul contains within itself the attracting force of a certain set of desires, and this force attracts to the soul certain conditions and experiences, and also attracts such experiences and conditions to the soul. There is no element of punishment or of injustice in the operation of this law, for it gives to each soul just what the soul requires to meet its indwelling unsatisfied desires, or else the conditions and experiences which will serve to burn out of the soul certain desires which are holding it back its progress, the destructions of which will make possible future advancement. So let me just recap this really, really, I'm going to say it real fast though, okay? So basically, this is really close to Hyperionism in that when you go, when you die, you go into the death current, which is an unconscious process that your mind enters into, and you will be reinserted into the holos via an unconscious process for the most part, for most souls. Now, 
what I wanted to say is that this world, in addition to blocking your optimization, it also blocks your desires, right? Because I'm sure there's a lot of things that you want, that you desire in this world. But can you get them? Can you achieve them? No, you, you can't. I mean, honestly, maybe you can to some degree, but for the most part, the world blocks you from, from even achieving simple desires that you may want. And so not only is this world about, you know, we, we need to use it to evolve, optimize, and grow, but we also need to satiate our desires. So my example was like, let's say that you want to help yourself grow and optimize by, let's just say, for example, studying philosophy. Well, if you aren't able to get food, if you're starving, it's probably really hard to study philosophy, right? Because you're concentrating on, on be, you know, being hungry. If you also, likewise, if you're really horny, uh, it's also probably hard to study, right? If you don't have a house, and, and you're worried about having a roof over your head, again, it's hard to optimize. In terms of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you aren't able to satisfy you know, your, the, the basic levels, so you can't look to higher levels. So we need to have a world where we're able to satisfy just desires as well. And uh, you, know, you should be able to satisfy your desires. Again, as long as you're not harming another person or infringing on someone else's rights or something like this, uh, of course, you should be able to because we're here to experience, learn, and grow, and we want to, you know, be able to satiate base desires as well as higher desires. So again, I want to point out the difference between Buddhism and Hyperionism as well, because Buddhism teaches detachment. Detachment um, is not is not what it's about. Uh, but but you may be wondering why, because in even in here, right, they say that it's. Uh, certain attachments that will bring you back, right? Well, l let me let me give you an example of a problem that could arise. And again, I'm going to do this real quick. But uh, let's say let's say that 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 you know you have this desire for food, and this is just an example. This is a really basic example. But let's say you have this this desire for food, but you deny yourself food. So you know you have this desire for food, but you want to deny this desire. So you're desiring, you're desiring uh, food, but you deny it. So guess what? You're really, really hungry, but you're denying it. So does this ever really go away? No, it doesn't extinguish. You're not extinguishing this, this desire. It's really just becoming shadow content. It's being repressed into your unconscious as shadow content. So when you die and you're in the death current, you're unconscious you know, you won't be able to consciously deny anything there. You're uncon you'll have this desire for food because it was never satiated. It was buried in your unconscious and that will be there and that desire will, will be there. Now I want you to imagine the opposite scenario. Let's say that you have this desire for food, so you eat. So you eat the food and guess what? You're full. Now you're full. You're satiated. Now do you have a desire for food anymore? No, you don't because you're satisfied, you're satiated. So when you die and you're in the death current and in an unconscious process, that won't be lurking with your unconscious as an unsatisfied desire. You will have satisfied it. You will have satiated it. Now, this is a really, really, really basic example, but uh, where you can see that this is why it's so important to understand shadow integration, understand your unconscious mind, and to create a world where we can satisfy our desires and needs so that we will be free to explore higher levels of reality and optimize and grow and learn. Um, so, you know, this is a, the, the world offers a lot of interesting things and interesting experiences and we want to be able to be free to explore our desires and satiate our desires and all these things. Uh, of course, of course we do. Of course we do. We don't want to live in this awful world where we want to deny ourselves all these all these things. This is a world of experience and we want to be able to be able to, uh, you know, to have the opportunity to experience. Once again, uh, as long as we are not harming another person or infringing on their rights and everything is consensual and, and all that, blah, blah, blah. Of course, that should always be taken, uh, implied. I always mean that, but that's what, you know, hopefully you can see the difference between, between, uh, these ways of thinking. And so I just said this all very, very quickly, but I will uh, keep in mind that it is a, it, a bit of a complicated subject, so I will perhaps do 
a full video on this at some point because it is important and needs to be fleshed out more. So, so Christopher Huntington says the world just blocked all our desires to learn the epic rant. Yes. And thank you, Ruby, for helping us wake up the world. So in a nutshell, that, that was the basic. Let me make sure that you guys can still hear me. Yes, indeed. Taylor says, I must have been on this slave pla uh, planet a while because I have a strong desire for knowledge. E excellent. Excellent. Welcome, Alan. Okay, so let's continue our reading. So the Rosicrucians teach that the individuals of any subrace, and honestly, uh, what they mean by subrace is really convoluted, and I don't want to get into it here, but it has nothing to do with racism or anything like that. Uh, it's an old occult idea that's honestly kind of dumb. Uh, but anyway, it has to do with evolution in a certain way, but but it's a, it's a very strange way of looking at it. Um, in many cases, such individuals are compelled into the great body of the subrace moves up to the position of the individual, but such individuals are not compelled to undergo a needless repetition of births and rebirths during this waiting period, but instead they spend the period on some exalted plane on which they come into contact with advanced souls and higher beings who act as their teachers. In some cases, these advanced individuals consent to return to earth life as great teachers in order to aid in the general progress of the subrace. The teaching is that among us today, many of such advanced and self-sacrificing souls are dwelling, aiding in the general uplift. And once again, so here they're talking about advanced souls dwelling upon the earth to aid in uplifting humanity. And as I said, that's who we are. That is who we are. That's what we are here doing today. That is what we are doing. Many of us are those souls that have come back to lift up humanity. And if you aren't actually one of those, guess what? You can get there. You can, you can, you can attain. No one is blocked from attaining that level. You can attain through studying Hyperionism, inner star actualization, ontological mathematics by integrating all this information. You, this is what we as as the most advanced Hyperions are, and you can get there. You can be one of those individuals that are here to lift humanity up. That is our goal. That is our mission. We are here to lift humanity up. So, so first raise yourself up, and then be one of those souls whose mission it is to raise the rest of humanity up. And that's why that's what it means to become a living archetype. And that's why I always talk about an inner star actualization. It's about in integrating all the, the unconscious archetypes in your mind to activate your higher self. And going even further, to, further than that, it's becoming a living archetype where you are such a powerful mind, such an influential mind, that other minds are tuning into your pattern and learning and growing from that pattern that you are projecting out into the world, that you are disseminating into the world. So, the Rosicrucian teachings concerning the value of experiencing experiences in each earth life are well illustrated by following the following quotation from a leading writer who says, Many object to the doctrine of rebirth on the ground that the experiences of each life, not being remembered, must be useless and without value. This is an erroneous view of the subject, for while such experiences may not be fully remembered, yet they are not lost to us all, but really form part of the material which our minds are composed. They exist in essence in the form of feelings, characteristics, inclinations, likes and dislikes, affinities, attractions, repulsions, etc. 
and are in this form just as much in evidence in our lives as are the experiences of yesterday, which are well remembered. Look back over the years of your present life and try to recall the experience of one year ago, five years ago, ten years ago, twenty years ago, thirty years ago, and as much further back as you can go, you will find that you can remember but few of the events of your life. The experiences of most of the days in which you have lived have been almost for completely forgotten. Though these experiences may have seemed very vivid and real to you when they occurred, still they have faded into nothingness now, and yet they are all, to all intents and purposes lost to you. She Wolf, She Wolf, thank you for helping us wake up the world. No, that's very interesting. I'll have to check that out. I'll look into it. But they are not lost. Remember, you are what you are today by reason of these very experiences which you now fail to remember. They exist in your character and have helped to mold and shape it. The apparently forgotten pains, pleasures, sorrows, and happiness are active, in, uh, active factors in the formation and maintenance of your character today. This trial strengthened you along certain lines that one changed your point of view and made you see things with a broader vision. This grief caused you to feel the pain of others. The disappointment spurred you on to new endeavors, and each and every one of them left a permanent mark upon your personality, upon your character. All men and women are what they are by reason of what they have gone through, have lived and outlived. And though these happenings, scenes, circumstances, occurrences, and experience have faded from memory, their effects are indelibly imprinted upon the fabric of the character and the individual of today is different from what he would have been had the happenings or experiences not entered into his life. And this same rule applies to the characteristics brought over from past incarnations. You have not the memory of the experiences, but you have the fruit in the shape of characteristics, tastes, inclinations, etc. You have a tendency toward certain things and a distaste for others. Certain things attract you while others repel you. All of these things are the result of your experiences in former incarnations. Your very tastes and inclination towards the study of the occult, which you are now, which are causing you to read these lines right now, they are your legacy from some former life in which some seed thoughts of esoteric teachings were dropped into your thought by some teacher or friend and then aroused your interest and attracted your attention. And I just want to say this again. So let me, this is really important. So let me pause for a moment. Again, this is saying that even if you can't remember your past lives, it's not as though they are useless because you can't remember what happened to you five years ago, or 10 years ago, or 20 years ago, right? There's a lot of things that you have forgotten and can't remember, yet they are what make you, you. They are stored within you as a mind. And even though you can't remember them, what may have happened to you five, 10, 15 years ago, even though you can't remember them consciously, they will shape your tastes and choices and actions today. So likewise, even though you may not remember your past lives, some people do remember fragments of their past lives, but even if you don't remember your past lives, all of those experiences are stored within you as a mind and are why you are who you are today. That's why, you know, a, a lot of individuals act like NPCs, non-playing characters. They don't really think for themselves. Well, these individuals either are very, very, you know, quote-unquote young souls. All souls are eternal. That's a, that's a way of speaking. Or they haven't had very many experiences conducive to their growth in the past. We, who are able to go higher and, and, and think in higher ways and are attracted to higher things are those who have in the past dedicated ourselves to higher learning or mental evolution or or things like this and i want to highlight this part your very tastes and inclinations towards the study of the occult which are now causing you to read these lines right now they are your legacy from some former life and this part here is very important 
in which some seed thoughts of esoteric teaching were dropped into your thoughts by some teacher or friend and then aroused your interest and attracted your attention. And this is why this is so important because this is our goal as Hyperians. You know how I constantly talk about sort of seeding the world with information? Well, this is what I'm talking about. This is what I'm talking about. And especially when the pandemic is over and we can start having actual Hyperion collectives all around the world, we are seeding the world. I talk about this all the time. Seeding the world with this information so that a new world will bloom. And they're talking about how previous people in your in your past lives have perhaps, you know, seeded your mind with information that is now causing your interest in these things right now. So this is what we are doing. We want to seed the world with this information so that it can bloom into a brilliant new world and that Abraxian consciousness will bloom. We are the first. This is why this is so exciting, guys. We are the first. We are the pioneers of this new consciousness. So it is up to us. You aren't passive observers. You're a part of it. You are a part of it. You are a part of birthing the new world. So this is why this is so important to spread that information. Spread this information. Plant those seeds. Spread those seeds across the world. Tell people about it. Share these videos. Share this information. We are the first. We, you, Again, you're not just a passive observer. You are a part of it. You learned some little about the subject, then perhaps much, and developed a desire for more knowledge along these lines which manifesting in your present life has again brought you to into contact with similar teachings uh, similar reachings and again this is why i say in hyperionism we're sort of like shooting out flares or it's like a lighthouse going say hey here we are we're over here to gather all the minds together this is why you're attracted to this information to those minds that can understand this information to bring them together so that we can work in a unified way instead of scattered everywhere and disunified. We want to be unified and then bring others around us up to our level and start that ripple effect. The same inclination will lead to further advancement along these lines in this life and still greater opportunities in future incarnations. You see, again, we are also, we're building a new world for our future selves as well. We're also planting these seeds right now. We can have a brilliant new world happen very, very fast. But imagine, imagine when we plant these seeds now, like where the world will be at, say, 100 years from now. Well, guess what? When we when when we we when we reincarnate, that world will be there for us. So we're building this world for us right now because we can do amazing things right now. Like especially when we start building Hyperion collectives and bringing people together, that's going to be amazing. We can have change happen really, really fast. Look how fast we're growing. But also think about the amazing transformative world. You know, think about where it will be, say, a hundred years from now, and we're building it for us, for our future selves. So the same inclination will lead to further advancement along these lines in this life and still greater opportunities in, the f in future incarnations. Nearly everyone who reads these lines will feel that much of the occult teaching now being received is but a relearning of something previously known. Are you feeling that? Are you feeling that? Again, it's really important. Nearly everyone who reads these lines or is listening to this right now is but a relearning of something previously known. It's like a waking up. Although many of the things now taught have never been heard before in this life. You picked up a book and read something and know at once that it is so because in some vague way you have the consciousness of having studied and worked out the problem in some past life. 
All this is in accordance with the law of attraction, which has caused you to attract that towards you for which you have an affinity, and which also causes others to be attracted to you. I'm not a, you know, I'm not a supporter of the law of attraction, but I don't, want, I don't want to get into that now. But it's, it's a lot more in depth than just what this is saying. But any, anyways, the, the gist of this is, is correct. In the same way, and from the same cause are the many reunions in this life of persons who have been related to each other in previous lives. The old loves, the old hates work out in the new lives. We are bound to those whom, to whom we have loved and also to those whom we have injured. The story must be worked out to the last chapter, although an increasing knowledge of the why and wherefore of such things may relieve one of many entangling attachments and relationships of this kind. Okay, so this was on reincarnation. Now we're moving on to life after death. So we're going to continue life after death and, and start that right now. But before we do, I have to piss. Of course. Of course I do. So now is a good time to ask your questions. I see some super chatted questions. I'll answer, ask those. So I'm going to go use the restroom. Then I'm going to come back. I'm going to answer your questions. And then we're going to read Life After Death. Uh, now is a great time. If you're on Facebook, go over to YouTube. Subscribe and like. Let me know in the comments because I'm going to be jumping into the comments and interacting when I come back. So now is a great time if you're on Facebook to do the great migration. I'll see you in a moment. Let's get those lights going in the meantime. All right. Hello. My hair is everywhere today, isn't it? Uh, what the hell? Stop that. Okay. Where are you guys? Where are you guys? What is my hair? It's just... I hate it. I hate it. Okay. All right. Back. Let's see what we have here. Let me take a look at, who was it? Uh, let's see, Happy Horrors, Shannon Garcia and Ruby Ryan. Thank you for helping us wake up the world. Shannon Garcia asks, what are your thoughts about empaths? Uh, empaths, I think are great. Empaths have an incredible ability to sympathize with others and place themselves in another person's shoes and experience what they're experiencing. And I really feel for them right now because there's a lot of pain in the world right now. So it's particularly heavy for those of us who experience other people's pain very acutely. Um, but I think, yeah, fantastic. Em empaths are fantastic. Uh, Ruby Ryan, thank you. I'm so happy I found you. You're amazing. Love from Australia. You're very welcome. Uh, Elena Anderson, I never looked at reincarnation this way. Totally amazing. amazing. Thank you. I'm glad that you are enjoying our talk this evening 
Happy Horror says, Morgan, there was a meditation video on YouTube that claims to help you recall past lives. Is recalling past lives through meditation possible? I, I, yes. I'm really hesitant to go with meditation. I like talking about terms in terms of void states. But, see, I would say that there's a difference here because uh, there, there is a purpose now. And the purpose is to avoid state. The purpose of it is to make the unconscious conscious. And in uh, exploring a past life would, be, of course, be making the unconscious conscious. Um, and yeah, I'm sure that there are guided meditations that are very useful for that. So can you use guided meditations for that? Yes, certainly. Certainly. Now, here's the big thing to remember is that when you have, you know, when you go into a void state or, or whatever have you, and you have these experiences, keep in mind it's very, very difficult to tell if you're having a true experience of a past life, or if you're experiencing something from the collective unconscious, or you're just experiencing some other content. So keep in mind that what you experience may very well be a past life, but it may also not be, or it may also be a combination of other things. Because think about, it's very similar to when you dream. When you have a dream, do you ever have a dream that's a pure reenactment of something that happened to you, like a memory? No, it's always, like maybe there'll be parts of it, but there'll be also a dragon in it, or, you know, just something, uh, other crazy things will be occurring too. So just always keep that in mind. It's very, very difficult to tell if you're having an actual experience of a past life or if it's, you know, contaminated, so to speak, by other unconscious factors. But, but regardless, it's, it can be extremely enlightening because you'll always be able to learn from it. So you'll always be able to learn from it. Just remember that and be careful. And why I say be careful is because you don't want to think, oh, yes, I was, you know, um the king of France in a past life, so therefore I'm going to move to France and uh, try and, you know, reestablish my kingdom or something. You know, you don't want, some people will do that, they'll think they're a certain person in their past life, and then they'll start making crazy decisions in their current life. So this is why I say you always have to be guided by logic and reason so that you don't lose your mind and think that you're, you know, you're, 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 you're someone that you're not. Is it possible that you were? It is possible. But you just, just be smart about it, right? Just be smart about it when you're exploring these types of things. Melissa says, why does it seem everyone is an empath? Aren't humans capable of just being empathic without the fancy title? Unfortunately, no. I mean, psychopaths, so what psychopaths, psychopaths lack sympathy. So psychopaths can put themselves in someone else's shoes to know how they're feeling and thinking, but they don't care. They don't care. So, you know, a psychopath would sort of be the uh, antithesis of, of an empath in a certain way. Uh, not 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 every human being does feel what another human being is feeling and and again that's that's not you know you're not evil if you don't if you don't feel what another person is feeling you're not evil what you need to do though is just understand it at least logically and care about them right so if someone is going through something really really difficult an empath will feel it right they'll feel that deep sadness or whatever. If you don't feel it, it's okay. It doesn't mean you're a bad person, but just logically realize, oh man, this person is going through a hard time. I might not feel it myself, like how they're feeling it, but I understand it and I still care about them and I still want to help them and make them feel better, etc. So again, if you don't feel it, you're not a bad person. Okay, please, you know, please understand that what you know you just have to make sure that you you care about people you can care about it even even if you aren't overwhelmed by emotion you can still care you can still you can still care
No, just to be clear, there is a difference between empathy and sympathy. Uh, which is why empath is kind of a misnomer. Uh, empathy is to be able is the ability to sort of put yourself in someone else's shoes and feel what they're feeling. Sympathy is the ability to put someone yourself in someone else's shoes, feel what they're feeling, and care about it. And care about it. So, you know, I again, I don't talk about empaths very much because I think, I, again, I think the term is a little blurry. So, but just in general, in general, in general, there are those who feel what other people are feeling and there are those who do not. One person is not good or bad. It just depends on what actions you take. You, you can feel what another person is feeling and be a manipulative asshole and you cannot feel what another person is feeling and, 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 and care about them. So it comes down to you as a person, not this ability to feel or not feel. Oh, Catherine. Catherine, thank you so much for helping us wake up the world. I appreciate that. Morg, you have done performance art in your life. Do you believe this has helped aid you in your awakening and ability to apply this information, help to allow you to achieve new mental states? Yes, absolutely, 100%. Not only because my life is all about overcoming. So what has my performance art done? Well, for the most, for I'll, two things real quick. First, overcoming public speaking, being able to overcome fear of public speaking, putting myself out there, being on stage, giving speeches, all this thing. Uh, also, my stunt work had a lot to do with pain and again I started stunt work to overcome a fear of needles and I kept pushing and exploring pain I was very much in that Dionysian state of mixing physical input to achieve interesting mental states and I write about this a lot in my book The Metaphorical Suicide I talk about it a lot in The Metaphorical Suicide actually um, now, just really quick disclaimer, don't do anything dangerous, don't hurt yourself, okay? I'm just saying this is something that I explored. Jordy and TaylorMade and Thena, thank you for helping us wake up the world. What's up with UFOs? Well, something like this is very difficult to say because it can be a variety of different things. For the most part, UFOs are people having a projection from their unconscious mind, alien abduction and stuff like this. It mostly has to do with the unconscious. And this is why they're very, very similar to DMT trips. Uh, but but actually seeing objects in the sky and, and stuff like this, uh, you know, that that's, that's, that's uh, you know, a completely different topic. But having to do with things like people having... Um, alien abduction experiences and stuff like this it is uh, mostly having to do with you know not like an alien physically abducting them or something but going into a very very deep mental state and possibly an altered uh, frequency channel possibly which is why it's very very similar to DMT trips Thena says what book are you reading Rosicrucians tried to recruit me I've yet to fully study it but when I did it was very interesting The Secret Doctrine of the Rosicrucians by Magus Incognito that's what we're reading today and you can read it for free if you google it and um, yeah look I, I you know I mean if you want to join the Rosicrucians whatever but you're going to learn way more from Hyperionism than you would ever learn from Rosicrucianism uh, you you again you don't we put things in precise logical terms in ontological mathematics we go infinitely beyond any of these old systems can go right you don't want to go into the past you want to step into the future we are the future so you know i mean again i'm not i'm not i'm not saying don't do it it's just you're going to be able to learn infinitely more from hyperionism and ontological mathematics than than uh, rosicrucianism could ever offer Trava, I missed your question. Trava says, are we really bound to others in each lifetime to work out uh, uh, things out in the end? It is possible. It is possible to have sort of like a soul group, um, meaning that, uh, you know, if you have a really strong bond with another person, 
then it is possible that you may choose to unconsciously or consciously, it depends on the development of your soul or mind, incarnate at a similar time and or place. It's very, very possible. It's, it, it is very, very possible that you, that you create such powerful mental bonds with someone you love or whatnot that you could sort of um, synchronize the reinsertion process. It, it, it depends on a lot of factors, but is certainly certainly a possibility. Jordy wanted me to address the loss of potential due to suicide. Oh, certainly. Yeah, certainly. So I want to say, again, Hyperionism is 100% opposed to suicide because your point here is to learn, grow, and evolve. And suicide is completely contrary to all that. I mean, look at where you are right now. You have gotten to this point where you have awakened to the stage of being able to understand this information. That's not easy. That's not easy to get to this point. Look at all the crazy distractions and traps in this world. But you've gotten to the point where you're here listening and integrating this information. That's not easy. So suicide, you're, you're going to completely, you're going to, you're going to, you know, you'll, you'll start over. And who knows if you'll be able to get back to an area where you would come across this information again. Right? You're, you're, you're just going to, you know, it's like you're playing a video game and you get to level 20 and then you just hit the reset button. It's like, well, you're just going to have to do it all over again. You're just going to have to do it all over again. It's not that the, it's not that your unconscious knowledge gets lost. It's that, again, look how, you know, I'm sure you, many of you probably believed in lots of wrong things or, or was in, or were in, just the wrong place in life, but finally you're here where you can integrate and understand this knowledge. So use this opportunity for your personal growth and evolution. This is the time to, Hyperionism again, it's like a mental cheat code. Hyperionism and ontological mathematics is that thing that will get you to evolve at an incredibly fast rate. So you don't want to stop now because you're at the point where you found this incredibly powerful information. So we're wholly against suicide. Suicide is a loss of progress. It's a, it's 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 a, it's it's a, it's not good. It's not good. No, I see someone says that everything happens for a reason and trying to justify suicide because of that. Everything does not happen for a reason. So that's a big misconception because we talk about the principle of sufficient reason and the principle of sufficient reason says that everything has a reason. Now, when we say reason, it doesn't mean like imbued with... When we say reason, it means that something can't happen magically or miraculously. If a domino falls over, it's because a previous domino hit it. But it doesn't mean that, oh, if a car hit and killed someone, it happened for a reason because that person was about to go uh, commit a murder. So that, that car, it, it happened for, a, it was a reason why it happened. It was preordained to cause this. No, 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 that's not true. That's not true. What we mean is by the principle of sufficient reason is that everything follows logical and rational rules. This is a system of, of logic and reason. Like a computer game, there's a code. Everything in a computer game is facilitated by the code. But it doesn't mean that there is a reason for everything. Do you see, do you see the difference that I'm trying to get across? I, I hope that you do in that You know, it doesn't mean that, oh, uh, I lost my job today 
but it happened for a reason because the universe knew that I would meet the love of my life at the, when I was filing for unemployment. So it happened, everything happens for a reason. I met the love of my life because I lost my, no, that's not true. That's not what we mean by, by the principle of sufficient reason. So uh, really important to know that difference. We are control of our life. We have free will. It doesn't play out like a, like how a fairy tale or something might might imply. All lies on me says, well, why then? Why do bad things happen then? Because there are bad people in the world that do bad things. We all have free will and we have free choice. Some people choose to do bad things. Some people choose to do good things. And I don't want to get into the semantics of good and bad here. That's a whole, that, that that's a can of worms. But everyone, things happen and things occur. Think about if you're playing an RPG, an MMORPG, right? Some people are player killers in the game and some people aren't. there is just people making choices. Now there is a goal to the game. We're all teleological striving towards the Omega point. So this is a world imbued with purpose and meaning, but how that can play out, it's all up to us. How that all plays out, how that all unfolds. The book, we're all heading towards an ending and we know what the ending is, but how the story unfolds to get us there is completely dependent on us. That would mean karma is ultimately a scam. Yes, karma is. That's why we don't adhere to karma because it's ill-defined and it's uh, talked about like a moral cause and effect. There is no moral cause and effect. There is no moral cause and effect. It doesn't work that way. Jordy says, yes, karma is a scam. Yeah, it is. It is. Okay. All eyes on me says, yes, I understand. I've always said things happen for a reason so that I wouldn't stay upset for so long. I mean, yeah. I, I, I could see why that would be comforting, but you don't want to have a comforting lie, right? So when bad things happen to you, though, just remember that struggle does lead to your growth. So look for a way you can learn from it. And watch my video, How to Transform Suffering into Power. So it's not about trying to just be like, oh, eh, oh, everything happens for a reason. But look for new opportunity. Look for how you can learn from it. Look for how you can grow for it. Grow from it. Brenda Chartrand says, you explained the PSR perfectly in your book. Thank you. Okay, I think we should probably continue reading. Oh, oh, I missed the super chat. Hold on. Cynthia Keys. I believe I know a mind who was in a different avatar some years ago. Have you any thoughts on this possibility? Uh, I would think that that's highly unlikely. I would think that that's highly unlikely if, if um, I'm understanding you correctly. Is it 100% outside the realm of possibility? Uh, no, but it's incredibly unlikely. Okay. Jason says, how can you resist the implant stations on the moon that make you forget your past lives? Okay, so those don't exist. This is what, what I mean, guys, by saying that new age beliefs and systems will go way off the rails. 
Look at someone like David Icke, for example. David Icke talks about some interesting things. He talks about how reality is frequency and how we interpret this frequency through our senses and ultimately everything is an illusion. And that's true, that's great. He also talks about the moon being hollow and, and controlling the world through the moon. That's, that's, that's utterly insane. So do you see how a lot of these new age types will have very interesting intuitions, but they just go way off into crazy land. So, and, and, and so don't worry, there are no implant stations on the moon that make you forget your past lives. And this is why we need to have uh, a firm ground of logic and reason. So the reason why we don't remember our past lives is because as Aldous Huxley said, our brain and nervous system is designed through evolution to filter our mind so only a trickle of consciousness comes through that is uh, that allows us to survive on this planet. In other words, it's a, it's a survival mechanism to allow us to focus on the world and to be able to survive in a physical environment where there are predators rather than being just inundated by information that was not consequential to our survival. Watch my video called Why You Can't Remember Your Past Lives Is Reincarnation Real? And I get into that topic in a lot of detail. Yeah, you want to stay away from those. Those conspiracy theories will make you go crazy. This is why you need to stay grounded in logic and reason. It's so important to stay grounded in logic and reason. Yes, so Jordy says New Agers have open minds, but they are way open all the way to Crazyville. Exactly. Uh, their, way, their minds are open. And, and it's funny that you say too open because it's true. And you, is too open a bad thing? Well, yeah, too open is a bad thing if you start believing like there's implant stations on the moon trying to limit your past life. Like you're, you, you'll, you'll go crazy. And I don't even re mean this in like hyperbole. The, these new age beliefs, they'll make you lose your mind. You're going to start thinking that people are lizards and uh, that, you know, you have to watch out for the secret moon base and that the earth is flat and all this crazy stuff. You're going to go, you'll go crazy. You'll go crazy. What are your opinions on realizing nirvana and untethering yourself from the cycle of birth and death? Well, I mean, I, I've talked about this a lot, so I don't want to go. If you really want to know, I talk about this over and over in many of my videos, so many of my videos, and, um, but in a nutshell, okay, look, in a nutshell, nirvana is not something that really exists. What exists is the source, and how do we get to the source? We get to it by transforming the holos into it, by optimizing ourselves. So to untether ourselves from the cycle of birth and death, we can never ever truly do that until in a certain, oh man, there's so many little details to this, but in a nutshell, because I want to get back to the reading, in a nutshell, we have to all attain this Abraxian consciousness so that we are transforming the world. And when we re reach the Omega point, the world will perfectly reflect the source, which means the world, the universe is, vanishes, and all that is left is the source and us in a realm of absolute perfection. So we don't get there fully and totally by detaching, but rather self-actualizing. So these, these idea of Buddhism and Nirvana and detachment prevents you. If we, let's say that we equate Nirvana with the source at the Omega point, if we were to make that equa equa uh, if we were to equate it that way, it's not, but if we were, Buddhism would prevent you from reaching it really. So, we can have glimpses of the source and we can experience it for sure. But remember that we, remember, always have that avatar, monadic, and Abraxian perspective. We can experience the source, certainly, as monads. But to experience it fully, completely, and totally as Abraxas, as the one, as all reality, all of us need to be able to get there, which means we need to transform all the minds in existence, which means we need to create a new world, we need to create a new universe, we need to optimize everything, everything. So it's all about self-actualization, self-transformation, world transformation, world actualization. Do you see the difference? People just want to be like, oh, all I have to do is detach, but that's, no, 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 no. Like, why would any of this exist? This exists as our training ground for evolution.
I, I love that. Pumpkin Holler says, stop being bitches, wake up and be what you are, a god. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I, li I, I like that. As long as we know that, that we're not being, you know, sexist by, sexist by saying bitches. I know you don't mean that. I just personally don't like to say that because I think it has a sexist connotation. But other than that, uh, I like what you're saying, yeah. Stop being idiots and wake up and be what you are, a god. Yes, well said. Well said. You're very welcome. Uh, Aconitis was the one who asked about Nirvana and whatnot. Says, thank you, Morg. I love how you speak of these things. You're very, very welcome. I'm glad that that helped. Whoa, I'm sliding all over the place, aren't I? Oh, that's nice. And uh, Angelie says, you are so femme, gorgeous. I love your actualized form. That's nice of you. Thank you. Joe Lopez says, is there a group of like-minded people, Hyperians in Atlanta, Georgia? Well, I'm sure there are some Hyperians right there now, but unfortunately, because of the pandemic, we've had to put a hold on doing things such as establishing Hyperion meetups uh, because of social distancing. So at the moment, we've had to put a hold on group stuff like that, but that is a very big plan of ours in the future, and we want to do that as soon as possible. Okay, so let's continue. I always get distracted in the comments because you guys ask such inter interesting questions. Okay, so here's the deal. Here's the deal, you guys. Here is the deal. Are you ready for the deal? <laughs> We're at the part in, in our reading to talk about life after death, which is an exciting part, and I want to get to it. But guess what? I have to t I, I have to use the restroom again. I don't really have to go that bad, but we're gonna jump into this reading and I don't want to pause in the middle of it. So I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go. All right, all right, I'm doing it. So, bye, <laughs> just a moment. If you're on Facebook, there's so many of you guys on Facebook, please come on over to YouTube, subscribe. All right. Oh, Johnny Six, thank you for coming over from Facebook. And Amanda as well, thank you for coming over from Facebook. Okay, let's do this. Let's do this. I wanted to finish the book today, but I don't know if we're going to be able to. We'll see. You're very welcome, Catherine. Oh. Here we go. The body of the Rosicrucians' teachings include very close 
and detailed instructions concerning the life of the soul between incarnations, the phenomena of the astral world and similar subjects, which would require many large books to record. In the present chapter, we shall attempt to present to the student a general idea of the teachings concerning such subjects, without going into details which cannot be presented at the present time in the space at our command. Oh, I'm sorry, Chris. Uh, let me get to your question during the next break. Thank you. Thank you for that. I'll, I'll, yes, you're right. I did miss your question. I'll get to it in the next, next break. The moment of death arriving for the person, the soul sloughs off the ordinary physical body and clad in the garments of the elemental soul, it leaves the scene of the physical body. At first, however, the separation is not complete. For the elemental soul is still attached to the physical body by a thin slender thread or cord, which finally breaks and allows the soul to proceed on its way. The garments of the elemental soul are of course in a sense physical, just as truly as were the garments of the visible body, which were just cast off by the soul. In these new garments, however, the person is invisible to the ordinary sight of men, and except in the case of clairvoyance, its presence cannot be detected. The disembodied soul passes then on to what occultists know as the astral plane, which, however, is not a place in any sense of the word, but is rather a state or condition of being having nothing to do with space limitations. The astral plane manifests its phenomena by means of a higher rate of vibrations than those concerned in the phenomena of the earth plane. Different planes of being may occupy the same space at the same time without interfering with one another. This is what we call uh, different um, uh, frequency configurations. Reaching the vibrations of the astral plane, the newly disembodied soul falls into a deep sleep or state of coma resembling the condition of the unborn child for several months before its birth. This condition is necessary in order to prepare the soul for its life on the new plane. The soul, which has left the earth scene with calmness and peaceful mental attitude, soon drops into a dreamless slumber. But those whose minds have been filled with strong desires connected with earth life often experience what are called astral dreams, in which they revisit the scenes of earth life, and if possible, may indulge in more or less distorted and dreamy communications through mediums and others. The strong desires and grief on the part of those left behind on the earth scenes also sometimes act to set up a rapport condition and thus disturb the sleeping soul and interfere with its needed preparatory rest. In this slumber state, the disembodied soul is fully protected from the influence or presence of other beings and is as secure as is the child in its mother's womb. Some souls require a long period of soul sleep on the astral plane before awakening into new activities, while others require only a comparatively short time. The general rule is that the higher the spiritual development of the soul, the longer is its period of soul sleep. The period of soul sleep bears a close relation to the period of the sojourn of the soul on the astral plane. The less developed souls rushing speedily to rebirth, while the more developed ones spend a much longer time on the astral plane between births. So basically saying that, you know, in, sometimes more advanced souls spend more time in between incarnations. And, you know, you can kind of imagine this as, how do, how do I put this? It's sort of like, think of it kind of like this. For those of you, which should be most of you here, which I know most of you are, who like to discuss higher things. Have you ever been with a crowd of people and all they talk about is Netflix and pop culture and they don't talk about any higher things at all, right? It's very, very base conversation. 
and and you get home and you're just really tired and really drained and you need to rest and and you think okay I can go to a party or gathering like that again but I need some time to rest because you know that that's very draining well it's sort of like that you know earth is kind of that level and so you know the more higher actualized and advanced souls uh, kind of need that break does that sort of make sense you, you kind of need that that intermission before going back to uh, a very low optimized environment that you need that r recovery time whereas you can imagine people who are more on a you know who, do, who don't think about higher things they don't really care they're just like yeah let's go out again and and I'm so excited to talk about I, I'm trying to make a Netflix reference, but I can't even think of like I don't know what's popular. But you know what I mean. So 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 that's a good way to understand it. If the soul sleep in the soul sleep, a strange process occurs, namely the preparation for the sloughing off of the lower sheaths of the soul, leaving it free to enter the life on the astral plane, clad only in the garments of its highest stage of spiritual attainment reached by it. Each soul awakens on the astral plane, prepared to dwell on the plane of its highest and best, leaving the rest behind. It awakens on the plane in which the highest and best in itself is given a chance to develop and expand, and to make progress, for the soul may and does make, many, make great progress in these between births sojourns on the astral plane. On the astral plane, there are countless subplanes and divisions thereof, all of which are more or less independent of each other. The distinctions between the planes are altogether the result of differences on the rate of vibrations, and do not represents, represent distances in space. Each subplane or division thereof is inhabited by souls exactly fitted to dwell upon it by reason of their respective degree of spiritual enfoldment. The great law of attraction operates in producing this result, and each soul feels perfectly at home on the plane in which it finds itself. The law works with unerring accuracy and makes no mistakes. By certain fixed natural laws, each soul is restricted to the realms of its own subplane or division on the astral plane, except that it may, if it desires, visit the planes beneath its own, but it cannot visit those higher than its own. The law of vibration acts as the astral policeman in these matters. Disembodied souls may thus communicate with and, ha and converse and association with each other, but only by the higher soul visiting the lower, and never the reverse. The scenery and environment of the various subplanes of the astral plane correspond with the ideas and beliefs of the soul occupying them. The Indian may find his happy hunting ground much more truly than some people would have us think. The thoughts and ideals of the soul is reflected upon the receptive substance of the astral plane, and each soul in a certain sense is the creator of its own environment and world. By its thought forms it builds itself a congenial world. So in Hyperionism, when you die, you enter the death current. And this is, for the most part, an unconscious state that is very similar to a dreamlike place. And this is why it says, by its thought, forms and builds itself a, congenious, a congenial world. By its thought forms, it builds itself a congenial world. This is, you know, again, very similar to what you do when you dream. You create a dream world for yourself. The soul makes progress during its sojourn on the astral plane and prepares itself for a better and happier environment upon rebirth. During that sojourn, it assimilates and digests the experiences of its last earth life and learns the true lessons of such experiences, and these are reflected in the new character which it is forming. Past mistakes are seen, and the true meaning of many puzzling experiences are perceived. The soul thus takes stock of itself and is better pre prepared to meet the conditions of its next earth life. And just as a reminder, for most minds, this will be unconscious. Just like you reflect on things unconsciously when you dream. 
Uh, but for more advanced minds, this can take on consciously. On the astral plane, the soul also receives the aid and assistance of some of the great spiritual teachers of the race whose chosen occupation is to administer to the wants of the pained and suffering souls who are striving to find the way out of their troubles and mistakes. Not only do these teachers administer to the strictly spiritual wants of the souls seeking their help, but in many cases the soul is given the advantage of great assistance in chosen occupations such as art, science, music, invention, etc., from advanced congenial souls ready and willing to help strugglers on the path. Many an artist, musician, writer, or inventory, uh, inventory has come into rebirth greatly benefited and improved by reason of contact with such helpers of the astral plane. Finally, after the longer or short period of sojourn of the soul upon the astral plane, the duration of which depends upon the degrees of spiritual development of the soul, there comes to it the first dawn of a new state or condition known to the occultists as the second soul sleep or slumber in which the soul is prepared for its new birth on earth which is coming to it. A writer has well described this state as follows. The second soul sleep is preceded by a transition state of gradually declining activity and consciousness and a corresponding desire for rest on the part of the soul. The natural processes of the astral plane nearing their close, the soul begins to experience a feeling of weariness and instinctively longs for rest and repose. It finds that it has lived out the greater part of its desires, ambitions, and ideals, and in many cases has also outlived them. There comes to it a wistful feeling of having fulfilled the purpose of its destiny and a premonition of the coming of some newer phase of existence. The soul does not feel pain at the approach of the second soul sleep, but on the contrary experiences satisfaction and happiness at the coming of something which promises rest and recuperation. Like the weary traveler who has climbed the mountain paths and has delighted in the experiences of the journey, the soul feels that it has well earned a restful repose, and like that traveler, it looks forward to the same with longing and desire. The same writer says, The soul may have passed by a few years, or perhaps a hundred, or a thousand years of earth time on the astral plane, according to its degree of development and unfoldment. But its stay, short or long, the feeling of weariness reaches it at last, and like many aged persons in earth life, it feels that my work is over, let me pass on. So sooner or later, the soul feels a desire to gain new experience and to manifest in a new life some of the advancement which has come to it by reason of its enfoldment on the astral plane. And from these reasons, and also from the attraction of the desires, which have been smoldering there, not lived out or cast off, or possibly influenced by the fact that some loved soul on a lower plane is ready to reincarnate and wishing to be with that soul, which is also a form of desire, the soul falls into a current sweeping toward rebirth and the selection of proper parents and advantageous environment. In uh, in co now, I just want to recall that in Hyperionism, uh, these are all interesting ideas. Not all of these ideas correspond to Hyperionism. But in Hyperionism, the setting of the initial conditions uh, is only available to those minds who have d attained some degree of consciousness within the death current. In cons in cons for, for most souls, it will be unconsciously determined. In cons uh, consequence whereof, it again falls into a state of soul slumber gradually and so when it its time comes it dies dies on the astral plane as it did before on the material plane and passes forward rebirth on earth there is another fact concerned with the awakening of the soul at rebirth however which is seldom mentioned by writers upon the subject and which is consequently not known to many persons familiar with the other facts concerning rebirth. This fact is as follows. Strictly speaking, the soul continues in a condition of partial slumber even after it has been reborn in earth life. It does not fully awaken at once in the body of the newborn child, 
in which it has been reincarnated, but on the contrary, it awakens only gradually during the early childhood and youth of the child. And uh, I think uh, our moderator Susan Mitchell will find this particular re reading interesting. A writer speaking of the above important fact concerning rebirth says, A soul does not fully awaken from its second soul slumber immediately upon rebirth, but exists in a dreamlike state during the days of infancy, its gradual awakening being evidenced by the growing intelligence of the babe, the brain of the child keeping pace with the demands made upon it. In some cases, however, the awakening is premature, and we see cases of prodigies, child geniuses, etc., but such cases are more or less abnormal and unhealthy. Occasionally, the dreaming soul in the child half awakes and startles its elders by some profound observation or mature remark or conduct. The rare instances um, in these children and infant geniuses are illustrations of which, in which cases, the awakening has been more than ordinarily rapid. On the other hand, cases are known where the soul does not awaken as rapidly as the average, and the result is that the person does not show signs of full intellectual activity until nearly middle-aged. Cases are known where men seem to wake up when they are 40 years of age or even older, and then take on a freshened activity and energy surprising those who have known them before. Here we ask the, ask the student to carefully consider another point concerning the need of and consequences of the second soul slumber. Just as in the first soul slumber, the soul underwent a period of spiritual digestion and assimilation of the experiences of its earth life. So in the second soul slumber, it undergoes a period of digestion and assimilation of the experiences on the astral plane. In both of these periods of spiritual digestion and assimilation, the soul converts the substance of the experiences into the solid flesh, bone, and blood of its character. It has outlived many things during its sojourn on the astral plane and has left many undesirable qualities behind it. In moving on toward rebirth during the second soul slumber, each soul goes to where it belongs by reason of what it is. There is no favoritism shown nor any injustice done. The soul is not forced to reincarnate against its desires. In fact, it re reincarnates because of its unsatisfied desires. It is carried into the current of rebirth because its tastes and desires have created bonds of attraction between it and the things of earth. These desires and tastes can be satisfied only through another experience of earth life. Now, I want to, you know, this is really important. There's a lot of discrepancies here, and I don't agree with everything that they're saying. But, but this is really important, and this goes to what I was saying, the difference between detachment, such that Buddhism teaches, and rather satiation. These desires and tastes can be satisfied only through another experience of earth life, amidst environment and conditions best suited to allow it to manifest those desires and tastes. So we want to have a world where we can experience our desires. Not this world that blocks our desires. Be honest with yourself. Are you able to attain what you really desire? Probably not. Probably not. So this world is geared towards stopping our evolution and optimization. Not only in the acquisition of knowledge and understanding of reality and ourselves, but also in experiencing our desires. We want to create a world where we can experience all our desires. Once again, within the bounds of reason, consent, and making sure that you're not harming another. It hungers to satisfy its desires and longings. Do you see how this is totally different how, from, from a lot of uh, like New Age and Eastern and mystical teachings? It's hunger to satisfy its desires and longings, and it moves in the direction in which satisfaction is possible. Desire is always the great motive power of the soul in determining the conditions of rebirth and the very fact of rebirth itself. And for most souls, this will be unconsciously decided. A writer on the subject has well said, The soul, preserving its desire for material things, 
the things of flesh and material life, and not being able to divorce itself from these things will naturally fall into the current of rebirth, which will lead it toward conditions in which these desires will flourish and become manifest. It is only when the soul, by means of many earth lives, begins to see the worthlessness and illusory nature of earthly desires, and it begins to become attracted by the things of the life of its higher nature, and escaping the flowing currents of earthly rebirth, it rises above them and is carried to higher spheres. The average person, after years of earthly experience, is apt to say that he or she has no more desire for earth life and that his or her only desire is to leave the same behind forever. Now this is really important because I want to point this out before I continue reading this particular quote. But I'm sure you've met people who say, I'm sick of earth, I'm done, I want to, I, I want to escape and, and just uh, you know, go to a realm of mind. Right, that's it. I'm I'm done with with Earth. I I have no more desire for it. Right. I'm sure you've heard a lot of people say that. But listen to what they're saying. The average person, after years of earthly experience, is apt to say that he or she has no more desire for Earth life, and that his or her only desire is to leave it behind forever. And these persons are perfectly sincere in these statements and beliefs. But a glance into their inmost soul would reveal an entirely different state of affairs. It's actually not true. They are not, as a rule, really tired of earth life, but are merely tired of the particular kind of earth life which they have experienced during that incarnation. They have discovered the illusory nature of a certain set of earthly experiences and feel disgusted at the same, but they are still full of another set of experiences on earth. They have failed to find happiness or satisfaction in their own experience, but they will admit, if they are honest with themselves, that if they could have had things just so and so instead of a different way, they would have found happiness and satisfaction. The if may have been satisfied. Uh, love, wealth, fame, gratified ambition, success of various kinds, etc. But be it what may, the if is nearly always there. And that if is really the seed of their remaining desires. So you see, people might say that they don't really want earth life. But it's actually not true. It's just they don't get what they need. If we had an earth perfectly optimized to delivering you your desires, well, it's completely different, right? And that's why we want to build heaven on earth. It's perfectly geared for satisfying your desires and also enabling you and giving you the time because once you do satisfy your desires, then you can focus on higher things, optimizing your mind, doing... Um, inner work, making the unconscious conscious, studying philosophy, uh, all, all of these different things. But that also comes with having a world optimized to satisfying your desires. Very few persons would care to live over their earth life in the same way. But like old Omar, they would be perfectly willing to remake the world according to their heart's desire and then live that earth life. It is really not the earth life at all which is distasteful to them, but merely the particular experiences of earth life which are disdained. Give to the average man and woman youth, health, wealth, talent, and love, and they will be very willing to begin the round of earth life afresh. It is only the absence absence of or failure in these or similar things which cause them to feel that life is a failure and a thing to be joyful left behind and a thing to be joyfully left behind the soul in its sojourn upon the astral plane is rested refreshed and reinvigorated it is again young hopeful vigorous and ambitious it feels within itself the call to action 
the urge of unfulfilled desires, aspirations, and ambitions, and it readily falls into the currents which led it to the scene of action in which these desires are manifested. This is so important. This is really important to understand. And this is why, you know, it's really that, again, it's not that earth life is terrible. It's that earth is terrible. Once we create a brilliant new world, earth life will be, will be brilliant and beautiful. It will be a place geared to optimize and delivering you all your desires and all the experiences you could possibly want along with satisfying all the levels of Maslow's hierarchy so that you can be desire you know you can be satiated and ready to contemplate things of a higher nature in education and exploring consciousness so this is really important to understand because I understand so many people say oh I just want to leave earth earth is terrible physical physical existence it's terrible it's not really that physical existence is so terrible it's just that we're in a prison planet we're in hell and this world is our clay to mold however we so will it's just it's been taken over by the demiurgos of this age the yaldabaoths of this age which are the rich elite one percent who have imprisoned your soul in this world to power their machine of production so instead, we simply need to destroy that machine and realize that we can completely remake the world into a beautiful place, completely optimized to fill your desires and to create a world where you can uh, have the experiences and education you need as well to contemplate things of a higher nature and optimize your soul. Another point which should be cleared up is that regarding the character of the desires which serve as the motive power for rebirth, it is not meant that these desires are necessarily low or unworthy desires or longings. On the contrary, they may be of the highest character and might be more properly styled aspirations, ambitions, or high aims. But the principle of desire is in them all. Desires, high and low, are the seeds of action. And impulse towards action is always the dis distinguishing feature of desire. Desire always wants to have things, or to do things, or to be things. Love, even of the most unselfish kind, is a form of desire. So is aspiration of the noblest kind. A desire to benefit others is as much a desire as its opposite. In fact, many unselfish souls are drawn back into rebirth simply by the by the insistent aspiration to accomplish some great work for the race, or to serve others, or to fulfill some duty inspired by love. But high or low, if these desires are connected in any way with the things of earth, they are rebirth motives and rudders. But in conclusion, let us say that no soul which does not, not in its mo inmost soul desire to be reborn on earth will never be so reborn. Such a soul is attracted toward other spheres, where the attraction of earth exists not. In that case, the law of attraction carries the soul away from earth, not toward it. There are many, excuse me, there are many souls which are now on the astral plane, undergoing the final stages of the casting off of the earthly bonds. And there are many souls now in earth life, which will never again return to earth but which after their next sojourn on the astral plane will rise to the higher planes of existence, leaving the earth and all earthly things behind forever. At the present time, we are nearing the end of a cycle in which a very great number of souls are preparing for their upward flight, and many who read these lines may be well advanced in that cyclic movement. So, uh, the important thing here that I really want people to take away is this understanding about this desire for people wanting to escape Earth. Really, we shouldn't be trying to escape Earth. The goal isn't to escape Earth, it's to remake Earth. The physical world is our playing ground and our training ground. It's our playing ground to fulfill our desires and it's our training ground to learn, explore, and grow in education, creation, and study, and optimization, and experience, and all these things. So it's our playing ground and our training ground. 
It's just not right now. It's our prison grounds. It's the prison grounds. So we need to transform the prison grounds into our playing, playing grounds and training grounds. And we can easily, well, I mean, t theoretically easily do it if, if humanity would get its collective head out of its ass. But that's our job. That's our mission here as Hyperions to raise the consciousness of humanity so that we can create that new world, transform hell into heaven. It's just that Demiurgos, the Yeldaboaths of this world, need to be taken out. And how will we do that? By initiating an Abraxian consciousness shift, a shift to Abraxian consciousness. So, I am going to jump into the comments real quick before we head into the next section but god damn it guess what i have to piss again and i really don't know why i have to do so much today but i do alas it is true so be right back ask questions while i do if you're on facebook go to uh youtube I am back. All right, let me go into the comments here. Mm, where are they? All right, hello everyone. Now I did see that Chris Chris asked asked a question, super chatted a question which I missed. Let me see. Let me see what it was and where is it? Where is it? Where did it go? Where? Where did it go? Oh, here it goes. Do you believe in the third eye idea? Not physically, but the idea of certain people that can see into different frequencies and wavelengths of the holos. I think that it is certainly a possibility definitely a possibility for some people to be so connected intuitively to the unconscious that they will be able to have experiences that others cannot. Um, there are a lot of fakes and charlatans out there, so be very, very careful. Be extremely careful because in my experience, nine times out of ten, a person is a charlatan. However, it is certainly very possible that a person can be so connected to right brain hemispheric functions, the frequency singularity, that they'll be, you know, have that connection to the unconscious that they could have experiences that others cannot. 
Are they literally seeing different frequencies of the Holos itself? I don't know if I would s say that. Um, I mean, it depends what you mean by that. However, however, th that that aside, I I'd have to d dive into what that would precisely mean more. Uh, but besides that, in general, there are people who can have experiences that others can't. Jessica Jordan says, what is the holos? The holos is our, that's what this, the, the so-called physical world is. We just, we, we call it the holos uh, because we want to, you know, because it's not actually physical. What is this universe? This universe is there, uh, an inner holographic mental projection. So the physical world around you, everything that you can see, touch, taste, smell, hear, that is the holos. Anthony Gay says, this dude loves hearing himself talk. This is literally a live stream of me talking. What do you want me to do? Just sit here and not talk? I mean, it's like going to a podcast and saying, why is the guy talking so much? Dude, don't just uh, go away if you don't want to hear me talk. <laughs> so weird. Arjun, nice to see you. Nice to see you, Arjunius. You're welcome, Megan. Stacy Rickleman says, I watch every day now. Awesome. I love it. I love it. I'm seeing a lot of references to my last video. I, did you guys like the last video I put out? I hope you found the chicken nugget in the video. Uh, there was a, I, it was a fun one to make. It was certainly a fun one to make. I'm glad you guys liked the last video. It was a, it, it was a good one. I, I, I was quite. If you guys, would you guys like to see more videos like that? I would like to. Um, I'm considering doing more like that because it was, it was a lot of fun answering questions and the. I don't know. I just had a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun making it. So if you guys like those kinds of videos, I'm happy to happy to do more of them if you if you enjoy that style. Uh, Chikavla, Chikal, Chikalva, Chikalva asks, is there a multiverse? No, there is not a multiverse. I actually answered this a couple times. People ask this question a lot. So I'm just going to say, I'll do a whole video on this because apparently it's a, a lot of people want to know about this. But no, uh, there is no multiverse. The many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics, which is a theory of multiverse, comes from trying to explain reality in material terms and... Uh, it's a materialist attempt to save their theory and it's completely fallacious and is a violation of Occam's razor so no there there is no multiverse since we live in a mental reality we know that we live in uh, a reality of mind that of course though there can be other frequency configurations but they aren't literally other universes not in the way that materialists mean it anyway Oh, okay. Interesting question. So, Gero Afonso, thank you for helping us wake up the world, says, Morg, I took a large dose of shrooms recently. I had a deep awakening, and now I'm freaking out about existence. Does it ever get better? Thank you. Hey, my friend. I, well, first of all, I, I, I fear for you. Uh, not feel. Feel for you. When you're first waking up to certain things, it can be... It can feel very frightening. 
So, first of all, if you, you know, don't feel like you have to do the, these things, of course. You know, if you don't like mushrooms, don't do them. But, yes. So, you should watch a video that I did called, Are You Waking Up or Going Crazy? Because it talks a lot about what you just said. So, it's called, Are You Waking Up or Going Crazy? I highly recommend that you check it out. So, integrating new information about existence, it takes, it can take a while because you're seeing reality in a completely new way. And the reason why you feel that sort of fear is because your old structure, your old reality tunnel is crumbling and you don't have yet a new reality tunnel to replace it. So it's kind of like a computer whose operating system is being uninstalled, but it doesn't have a new operating system to replace it yet. So it's it can feel like really hard, you know. It's almost like you're in a under the ocean, and you you know you don't you don't have anything to grab on to, and you don't really know which way's up or which way's down, and and it's very confusing and tumultuous. So watch uh, watch my video. It, it it takes time for sure. Watch my video on are you waking up or going crazy, which talks about how to navigate that and how to install a new operating system on logic and reason, which is really important because so many people at this point will go to new age beliefs and you'll, that that's the thing that'll make you go crazy when you go to the new age beliefs. That's what'll make you go crazy. You wanna make sure that you have a new operating system based on logic and reason. So great question, my friend. Kevin Gilbert says, how do we know we're not coming back as ants? And do they have souls? Ants have souls? Yes, they do. Um, all avatars which have a sufficient degree of complexity to host a monad uh, have souls. How do we know we're not coming back as ants? Well, it's, it's, it's ridiculously unlikely that that would be a possibility because the soul is at a certain level of optimization. And so when you are going to link to a new avatar, you'll link to a new avatar that corresponds to the optimization of your monad. So uh, a soul or a monad that would link to an ant would be at a very, very, very low level of optimization. And so it's highly unlikely that you, as a very highly optimized monad, in comparison to an ant, would select unconsciously or consciously an avatar host. It, it doesn't make any sense to do that. So it's, it's, high, it's, it's highly unlikely. You are a human drawn to human desires and human things. You know, unless you really, really desire to, like, pick up big pieces of dirt and move them you're probably not going to be attracted to an ant avatar. David, so nice to see you. So nice to see you and thank you for the $100 donation. My God, uh, Hyperion Mr. Beast is in the chat. What does David say? David says, spend time by oneself is not a, ba is not a thing to avoid. Very true. It's vital to our growth. Very true. Don't feel inadequate while others go out to keep themselves distracted. Very true. To get in balance within, we must experience solitude. Yet most people are afraid of it. In silence, we can hear our eternal truth. Yes, absolutely. Very true. Great, great, great observation, David. And I agree 100%. So many people just go out and are constantly distracted. People don't even, uh, people avoid being with themselves in silence and thinking. People avoid thinking at all costs. They're constantly distracting themselves. Even when they're in the car driving somewhere, they'll blast music. Nothing wrong with it, music is great. But I'm just saying, people will do everything they can avoid to being with their own thoughts and reflecting on their thoughts. Which is crazy because that's what higher consciousness is about. It's about reflection. It's about uh, metacognition, which is thought thinking about itself. And humans active, actively avoid metacognition through distraction. So, really great. And thank you, David. By the way, my God. So, David, my God, you get, we get party lights for David. 
And what... Come on, it's not much of a party back there. Let's keep... Uh, what... What shall we... What shall we send in the chat for David? Let's send some Omega Spheres. Omega Spheres for David. Hello, Talrock. I'm glad you made it. Jordy says music helps me reflect on my thoughts. That's great. You know, that's that's fine. But there are some people who will use music as a um as a distraction. But I but I know what you mean, you know. And thanks again, David. You're, you're amazing, my friend. You are amazing, my friend. Remember, guys, if you're on Facebook, please come on over to YouTube. Do it! There are so many of you on Facebook. Can y'all can y'all come to YouTube? Facebook's so much better. Come over to YouTube, subscribe, help us. Uh, Triple M, Million Monad March. Face if you're on Facebook, you're not seeing a lot of my posts. Facebook is constantly censoring me to a really bad degree to the point where eh, I don't even want to say. But just just uh, come on over to YouTube, hit subscribe. What are our likes at? 286? Nice. Can we get 300? Can we get 300 likes? Let me... Uh... I am really hungry. And, you know, honestly, guys, I've been so busy, busy with video creation. I haven't had time to cook. So I've been having to get takeout, which ugh, I really want to cook. But I've been having to get takeout and vegan takeout. I don't like it because they they try and get so fancy with 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 all the fake meat products. Like oh look a vegan hamburger and 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 vegan orange chicken and and it's good. Don't get me wrong, it's good. But I I just want some mashed potatoes and and roasted vegetables or something. But for some reason the vegan places don't don't have that because they try and get so fancy. And I and I get it, but I just want some, you know, like. Vegetables and potatoes, please. But I haven't been able to cook lately because I've been so busy creating the videos. Madison Rose says, man, I've got some amazing vegan taco places by me in East LA. Well, no, I mean, there are great vegan taco places, but I don't want vegan tacos. Like, I don't want, if they're avocado tacos or something like that, where there's vegetables in them, that's great. But I don't want, I don't want like fake beef or fake carnitas or fake, it's good. I like it. I like that, but I'm sick of it. I just want, I just want some fresh vegetables and mashed potatoes and you know like like actual vegetables i just want some damn vegetables oh jackfruit tacos yeah <laughs> look at this junior junior <laughs> this is funny so junior panita Super chatted $5 and said, There is no creation. We appointed to die and judgment comes soon after from the Lord. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the... Well, no, you're wrong. So, no. Jesus is not the way and not the truth and not the life. But thank you for the $5. Thank you for, 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 for funding the demise of fundamentalist Christianity. 
Oh, I missed Angela. Sorry. Uh, shout out to Angela and Chris and Sandra if I missed you guys for the super chats a long time ago. David, damn it. David did another $50. Thank you, David. David says, you are amazing. Can't thank you enough for your readings and the knowledge you share with us. You are very much appreciated. And t uh, to you too, beautiful community in the chat. Much love to you all. By the way, vegan food is the best. You're awesome, David. Thank you so much. God damn, David. Well, jeez. Let's do um. Let's do some. Let's send some Ad Astra's, Ad Astra's over to David. We're gonna need some new emojis pretty soon. We're gonna need some new Hyperion emojis. Ad Astra's in the chat for David. Thank you so much, man. That's, uh, that means a lot. That means a lot. Hyperion, Mr. Beast. Only one master shake says Jesus wasn't too bad. His followers need some help, though. I mean, the only thing bad about Jesus was that the, the, the only thing bad about Jesus was that he didn't promote logic and reason, and that his 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 philosophy was really passive. Like you know, if you get hit on the cheek, turn the other cheek so they'll hit you again. That's really bad. That's really bad and fosters submission. Um, so yeah, I mean. He, honestly, Jesus Christ wasn't terrible. Certainly not. Did he teach amazing things? I mean, they were okay. But yeah, the, the Christianity is really the big problem. Fundament, fundamentalist Christianity is the big problem. Fundamentalist Christianity is, is the big problem. But I'm complete a big proponent of therapeutic blasphemy. So if you want to blaspheme Jesus because you need to get it out of your system because Christianity is embedded within the collective unconscious oh yeah like blasphemy is therapeutic uh yeah so because that's that's embedded within within our, our thought processes seashell vagabond says what are your theories on ghosts and hauntings well once again this can be a projection from the collective unconscious or the personal unconscious. So if a person has an experience where um, they, they are seeing a ghost and no one else can see it, it's most likely uh, tuning into something happening in their own unconscious. If, if they are having a, if there's a collective experience, then it's possible that, we're, that they're tuning into a collective, something collective. Uh, you know, there's also, it's also could be possible that um, a monad is somehow inciting an experience in somebody. Another monad could possibly, it's not outside the realm of possibility that perhaps a monad is inciting an experience uh, in somebody or something like this. But once again, there's so many hoaxes out there. So I just always want to say, be careful, guys. So many ho nine times out of ten, the stuff out there are hoaxes and charlatans. Or just people that are insane. There are a lot of insane people out there. Okay. Oh, hey, we got, we got, I didn't even notice. We got past 300 likes. We're at 316 likes. Nice job. Excellent. E excellent work. Excellent work. Excellent. 
Angelica Torres says Jesus was the ultimate example of unconditional peace. Maybe one could say that, but we don't want unconditional peace. That's the, that's the, um, I mean, I, I think you mean unconditional. I would rephrase that as unconditional love. Unconditional love is not something we want. We don't want unconditional love. We want conditional love because should you love Nazis? No, you shouldn't love Nazis. If you love Nazis while you're hugging them, they're going to kill you. It's not good. It's not a good thing. It's not a good thing. So this is Karl Popper's paradox of, of tolerance that if you tolerate everyone, that includes the intolerance and intolerance will breed. So basically, if you love the hateful, that will actually breed hate because it allows hate to persist and multiply. So watch my video on, on why loving everyone doesn't work to understand that better and Karl Popper's paradox of intolerance. Okay, please no, no, no preaching in the comments, okay? No, no, no preaching. No, no preaching in the comments. Okay, let us, let us, let us continue the reading. Let us continue the reading because some of these comments are really uh, cracking me up. Jordy says book, please. Yes, let's get back to the book. Some of these, some of these comments, my God. Okay, let's continue the reading. And this is the final chapter. Can you guys believe it? The final, the final chapter of the secret doctrine of the Rosicrucians. We will start now. The Rosicrucians teach that there are seven cosmic principles present and operating throughout the cosmos and extending even to its smallest activities. These seven cosmic principles are as follows. The principle of correspondence, law and order, vibration, rhythm, cycles, polarity, and sex. The student is now asked to consider each of the above stated cosmic principles in detail. The principle of correspondence manifests in a certain correspondence or analogy or agreement between manifestations of the various planes of activity in the cosmos. It is indicated by the old hermetic aphorism, as above, so below, as below, so above, and by the arcane axiom, ex uno disque omnis, or from one know all. The Rosicrucians and all other ancient occultists hold that the laws governing the nature and activity of the amoeba likewise govern the nature and activity of man and beings higher than man. What is true of matter is true of energy and of mind. The occultists make a practical application of this universal principle in the direction of studying the unknown by means of the known, with the knowledge that the same laws govern each. Thus, just as the solar system may be known by means of studying the atoms and molecules, so may the higher planes of being be studied by an examination of the lower planes in manifestation before us. Now, this is sort of true, but not completely true. You can't really understand the solar system by understanding the atoms and the molecules. I get what they're sort of saying, but let me explain to you in terms of Hyperianism and ontological mathematics, we have a bit of a different view. And this is that we have the source formula, which is the one formula for all of existence that governs everything in existence. So by understanding and and knowing this formula, we can know everything about existence. So this is how we can deductively ascertain certain truths about reality by knowing this formula here, which is the source formula, and knowing that this is the one formula that governs all of existence. And everything is governed by this formula and its different expressions. We can apply as above, so below to this in a certain way by looking at the Fourier transform. 
because the Fourier transform, as we can see here, the right side is blue and the left side is red. The right side is the frequency domain of mind and the left side would represent, say, the space-time domain of matter so that we know they correspond to one another. If we looked at the red domain as the space-time of matter being the below and the blue domain being the frequency singularity of mind, the source, as the above, we could say as above, so below. The above gives rise to the below. You can see that here as the uh, above, the frequency singularity of mind, you can see it here, combine to form the below, which is a f our perceptual experience of the space-time representation of frequency information. Um, so after discovering the operation of certain principles in one thing, we may safely by reason by analogy based upon the assumption that these higher principles exist in other things on a higher plane and thus discover the nature of the unknown X. So they're kind of talking about, mm, I mean, yes, it's true in a certain extent, but just to be clear in ontological mathematics, we start from the source formula and go down. We start from the above to understand the below. Understanding the below to understand the above, uh, you, you, you can in a certain way, but it's gonna be an interpretation, a mediation. You really want to get to the deductive principles of existence. And this is why we are a rationalist system. Using reason, we can understand this. It can be very, very helpful, though, to do it the other way. It's, this is where we understand things dialectically, uh, but for a different purpose. But anyway, I digress. Thus, the occultist reasons that there is law in order manifest on every plane of being, very true, that there is a principle of vibration manifest on every plane of being, uh, yes, that there is a principle of rhythm manifest on every plane of being, a principle of cycles manifest on every plane of being, and that there is a principle of polarity manifest on every plane of being, and that there is a principle of sex manifest on every plane of being. And the further that human human investigation is pushed into the unknown, the greater is the proof of the existence of these cosmic principles reasoned out by the ancient occultists upon the fundamental basis of the principle of correspondence. A writer has said of this cosmic principle, there is always a correspondence between the laws and phenomena of the various planes of life and being. The grasping of this truth gives one the meaning of solving many a dark paradox, many a hidden secret of nature. There are planes beyond our knowing, but when we apply the principle of correspondence to them, we are able to understand much that otherwise would be unknowable to us. So, in Hyperionism, it's not so much by applying a principle of correspondence. I mean, yes, in a certain way, but ultimately, how do we know things that are hidden? We know them through the source formula and applying ontological mathematics. That's how we do it. Other things will be in terms of interpretation and probability, but for deductive certainty, we start deductively with the source formula. So it is the mathematical frequency nature of reality that will reveal hidden worlds to us. For example, all the you know, hidden aspects. There are even, you know, things that, that we couldn't perceive but were predicted mathematically. Uh, black holes being case in point were predicted mathematically. So by understanding the mathematical nature of reality, we can reveal that which is hidden. Uh, this principle is, and, and this is, you know, very important to Hyperionism and ontological mathematics and, and much more powerful than what the Rosicrucians are talking about because they don't have, they don't, they, that's not how they do things. And it's, that is how you need to do things to come to certain knowledge of existence. True in, in terms of epistemology, true in certain knowledge, that's how you have to do it. 
through understanding the frequency mathematical nature of existence. This principle is of universal application and manifestation on the various planes of the material, mental, and spiritual universe. It is a universal law. The ancient hermetists considered this principle as one of the most important mental instruments by which man was able to pry aside the obstructions which hid from view the unknown. Its use even tore aside the veil of Isis to the extent that a glimpse of the face of the goddess might be caught just as a knowledge of the principle of geometry enables a man to measure distant sums in their movements while seated in an observatory, so a knowledge of the principle of correspondence enables man to reason intelligently from the known to the unknown, um, studying the um, moneron, moneron, he understands the archangel. I mean, sort of, but again, most certainly only through ontological mathematics and the source formula can one truly understand this. You're going to make a lot of mistakes. Like for example, talking about the atom versus the universe uh, versus the solar system. The model of the atom that has electrons, you know, sort of orbiting like like a like a planet orbi or orbiting the nucleus like a planet. That's false. That's false. So you're going to run into issues if you have the sort of empirical stance to existence. Even if you're interpreting it in metaphysical terms, empirical observational data is always going to mislead you when it comes to true and certain knowledge, which is why we must know things mathematically. Without going deeply into the matter of the application of this particular cosmic principle, we may say that one of the fundamental facts of being discovered by the ancient occultists is that the application of the said principle is this. That is everything there is to be found, substance or body, motion or active energy, and consciousness or awareness. Therefore, dealing with planes of being, which at the time they had but little knowledge, the ancient occultists always assumed the existence in everything on the unknown plane of these three great forms of manifestation. And all future esoteric investigation and discovery tended to disclose facts corroborating and sustaining the original assumption derived by analogy and discoveries of modern science has invariably tended in the same direction. I mean, it's interesting observation, but it's, gonna, it's going to lead to misunderstanding if you're going by analogy and, and all this sort of thing. It may be interesting to take a hasty glance at the presence of these three forms of manifestation as follows. Substance. The ancient occult teaching that everything has body seems to be fully corroborated by all subsequent investigation, but it must be noted that by substance or body is not necessarily meant what modern science calls matter, for the latter is merely one form or phase of substance or body. Matter as we know it has a great range of manifestation, within the limits of which are found the hardest granite or steel or diamond, as well as the finest and most subtle and tenuous gases. The discovery by science of what it calls radiant matter opens out uh, a field to science previously tilled only by the occultists and metaphysicians. Such matter is really not matter at all, but supermatter and a higher form of substance or body. But known to the occultists, there are forms of substance or body as much finer and rarer than radiant matter as the latter is rarer and finer than granite, steel, or diamond. Even the hypothetical ether of science is gross by comparison. That's outdated, by the way. But with some of the forms and phases of substance or body known to the occultists and alchemists, as a writer has said, the field of matter as known to science as compared with the real extent of the principle of substance is as no more than a hairline drawn across a yardstick. The occult teaching informs us that there are living beings in existence on other planes whose bodies are composed of substance so fine and subtle that the term ethereal is the only one to even fairly be fairly adequate and employed in connection uh, with them. Remember, the occult teaching is that everything has substance and or body, and everything includes all that is manifest. Well, I mean, we know that um, thought, thought does not have substance or body. Uh, I mean, thought is a substance, but it is a mental substance. So it doesn't have any sort of extension 
it doesn't uh, have any sort of height, length, width, that sort of thing. So we know that, that mind is a substance indeed, but not a material substance. It doesn't have extension. It doesn't have extension. And if you're talking about a being that has body, no matter how fine you may be, you may say it is, if it has extension, that is still matter of some kind. But we know that thoughts, thoughts are not material in, 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 in any sense and have no extension. They are, in Cartesian terms, they are unextended. Motion or active energy. The ancient occult teachings that everything moves seems to be fully corroborated by all subsequent investigation. Motion, of course, results from the present and power of active energy, and active energy is found everywhere present in manifestation. Uh, this, is, this is true to some degree. Both the occult teaching and modern science teach that everything is undergoing constant change, and change is impossible without active energy in motion. Active energy manifests through gravitation, cohesion, chemical affinity, electronic attraction, expansion, contraction, centrifugal and centripetal force, light, heat, magnetism, electricity, etc. And there are much finer forces than these known to the occultists, though not as yet discovered by science. Wherever there is substance, there is motion. Nothing is at absolute rest. Everything moves from the tiniest electron or atom up to the greatest sun. All is in constant motion. Remember, the occult teaching is that everything moves and everything includes all that is manifest. Uh, yeah, that th this is true. This is true to some degree. This is I, I would agree with this. Small caveat that uh, uh, syntax, uh, the mathematical laws of existence, don't change. And you could also say that the source is changeless. But for the most part, when they say all that is manifest, they probably mean something else. So yes, in, 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 very, in a very broad stroke, I would agree with this. Consciousness, the ancient occult teaching that everything is aware, seems to be fully corroborated by all subsequent investigations. Um, let me comment on this after I read a bit, but as we have seen in the plane in the study of the chapters concerning the plane of consciousness, there is manifested consciousness of some form, phase, or degree on all planes of life and being. Wherever there is substance, there is also motion and also consciousness. Substance, consciousness, and motion are always found together, never apart or divorced out from another. There can be no substance without consciousness and motion, and no motion without substance and consciousness, and no consciousness without substance and motion. Uh, and above, we have put... So, uh, I mean, I would uh, disagree with this. So their idea, would they, they would say that an electron is aware. An electron is, doesn't have a mind. An electron is a thought. So an electron, we are minds and we connect to bodies. There is no mind connected to an electron. An electron is formed by thoughts. So an electron does follow a mental trajectory, but it doesn't have a monad attached to it. So there's definitely a difference there. The principle of law and order. The principle of law and order manifests in the presence and manifestation of a regular sequence and orderly possession of phenomena in the universe of things. It is voiced by the celebrated axiom of a leading scientist that the universe is governed by laws. Yes. The spirit of this principle of truth is embodied in the very term of the cosmos. Yes. Which term is derived from the Greek term cosmos, meaning the world or universe considered in connection with perfect order and arrangement as opposed to chaos. Yes, cosmeticos, uh, cosmos meaning order. In the occult teaching of the Rosicrucians, it is impressed upon the student that there is no such thing as chance, and so far as chance is used in the sense of uncaused happening. The student is taught that even in the instances in which blind chance seems to rule, there is still the manifestation of law and order and causation. 
Though the cause may lie outside of human knowledge, the term chance is now employed by careful thinkers only in the sense of the unknown or unforeseen causes of an event. In the cosmos, the same causes manifesting under the same circumstances always produce the same effects. All of our sciences and thought is based upon this universal fact, and intelligent reasoning would be impossible without the tacit assumption of the truth of this principle. This is just the principle of sufficient reason. Uh, there is no there is no true randomness. Everything follows mental causation. It's not though that it's not physical determinism, however, but it's mental determinism in that everything follows mental causation, but we as monads are self-determining deterministic systems. Oh, hey, guess what? I have a video coming out all about this on free will, which will probably be out on Wednesday. So look forward to all this talking about free will, what determinism is, and how we can unify determinism with free will and all this sort of thing. Everything happens because of so-and-so. This is just the principle of sufficient reason. We talked about this before. It means that things happen according to reason, not that everything necessarily happens in sort of a fairy tale interpretation of things happen for a reason. Like, oh, I stubbed my toe because that made me uh, bump into my future boyfriend. Not like that. Uh, every, uh, given certain causes, there must ensue certain results and effects. Nothing ever happens, says the old proverb, and nothing ever does happen except for definite causes and in pursuance with universal laws. As someone has said, there is no room in the universe for anything out outside of and independent of law and order. The existence of such an outside something would render all cosmic law ineffective and would plunge the universe into chaotic disorder and lawlessness. This is absolutely true. Again, this is the principle of sufficient reason. And the source formula literally is the ontological expression of the principle of sufficient reason. So if we were able to visualize the principle of sufficient reason, it would be this. It would be this. You have a circle, a point moving around a circle, which is a perfect perfect pattern, enacting perfect motion with no point privileged over the other, any point privileged over any other. So once again, this is how we can derive existence from the principle of sufficient reason, and this principle of sufficient reason being the, um, in the source formula being the ontological expression of the principle of sufficient reason. A writer has said this, a careful examination will show that what we call chance is merely the idea of obscure causes, causes that we cannot yet understand. So, you know, true chance doesn't actually exist. And for those who might be wondering about quantum mechanics, Hyperionism rejects the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics. So there is actually no true randomness. The, uh, everything is determined mentally. So the wave function doesn't randomly collapse or anything like that. It is mentally determined and follows mental determinism. The word chance is derived from a word meaning to fall as the falling of dice from the box onto the board. The essence of the idea being that the fall of the dice are merely happenings unrelated to any cause. And this is the sense in which the term is generally employed. But when the matter is closely examined, it is seen that there is no chance whatsoever about the fall of the dice. Each time a die falls and displays a certain number, it obeys a law as infallible as that which governs the revolution of the planets around the sun and the movement of the sun itself. Back of the fall of the dice are causes, or chains of causes, running back further than the mind can follow. The position of the die in the box, the amount of muscular energy expanded into the throw, the condition of the table, are all causes the effect of the combination of which may be seen in the fall and the position of the die. So basically it's saying if you roll the die, roll a die, it seems like that that's chance and random, but it actually isn't. The position of your hand, the velocity at which you know you throw the die, the momentum given, the angle at which it hits the table, all these things will determine what side of the die it lands on. It's not actually random, it's not actually chance, it just seems like chance because those initial conditions are so obscure.
But the Rosicrucians do not believe in fatalism in the ordinary sense of that term. Fatalism denies that preceding events have any causal relations to preceding events and holds that the fated event would have happened in spite of any precedent event. Fatalism makes the fated event stand apart from the law of cause and effect and implies that the event arose from the operation of some arbitrary degree or will. The fa um, so I'm, I'm going to go over this for a bit because I have a video coming out on Wednesday all about free will that will show you that Hyperionism is a deterministic system, however not physical determinism. And since it's not physical determinism, since we are all self-determining deterministic systems as eternal monads, we are free to determine ourselves. So look forward, it's going to go into a lot more detail, so look forward to that coming out on Wednesday, all about free will, most likely Wednesday. The principle of vibration manifests in the manifestation of a state of vibration in everything in the manifested cosmos. It is voiced by the old occult axiom, everything vibrates. Modern science has advanced to the position of the ancient occultists who asserted that everything in the cosmos was in the state or condition of continuous vibration. And we know this, of course, to, you know, to be true. We, we, again, we can see this in, in the source formula. If we just think of vibration as being frequency, which it really is, vibration is just frequency, this is clearly embedded within the source formula. The source formula is embedded within everything. Therefore, frequency is embedded within all reality. We just have space-time representation uh, of that. So, you know, this... This is not actually a solid object. It is a complex of frequency. It is a frequency structure. It just, you perceive it as being a solid object. It's, that is its space-time Fourier representation. But in actuality, it is a complex of frequency. The principle of rhythm manifest that universal regular swing or time beat which is apparent in all the manifested world from its highest to its lowest manifestation. The occult axiom everything beats time expresses this fundamental fact of the cosmos. Rhythm means regularly recurring motion, change or impulse proceeding in time, measured alternating sequence. Rhythm manifests in regular reoccurrence, succession in turn. And again, we can clearly see this in the source formula. You can always see this in the source formula. Rhythm is embedded in the source formula. I'm just going to go by this quickly because, because we've, we've studied things like this before. And they're just sort of summing it up. The principles of cycles. The principles of cycles manifest that universal circular direction or process or progress which is apparent in all the manifested world from its highest to its lowest manifestation. Everything is cyclical. And again, we can clearly see that in the source formula. And then we have the principle of polarity. The, there are opposites or antinomies, which is apparent in the manifested world. Everything has an opposite. Again, we can see this in the source formula. Uh, you know, the highs and the lows. When it's at the peak, it's a positive. It goes all the way down to the negative. We have polarity here, highs and the lows. And I know I'm going through this very fast, but this is extremely, uh, extremely, extremely, extremely similar to the seven hermetic principles, which I did a whole video on. So if you think, oh man, you're going by this too fast, and you really want to know all this, it, this is very similar to the seven hermetic principles. So do a search on my channel for the Kabbalion and the seven hermetic principles, and it's basically this. I know there's a lot here, but again, if you want to know it, the principles of sex... The principle of sex manifests in the universal presence of sex dis distinction activity, which is apparent in all the manifested world. 
all creation is generation and all ger generation proceeds from sex. So again, we have we have the whole feminine feminine and masculine thing and, and I've talked about that so much and I'm sure I talked about it in in the book and the Kabbalion. So check that out. Check check it out. And honestly, so I know I I basically just kind of skipped this, but it's so close to the seven principle hermetic principles and the Kabbalion. So if you want to see that, go check it out. But here's the thing: we're running short on time, but I want to hang out with you guys in the chat. So I wanted to get 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 that done real quick so that I had some time to hang out with you guys in the chat. So that's what I'm going to do right now. I'm going to hang out with you guys in the chat and um, answer some questions because I really like doing that. Uh, it's kind of my favorite thing. So I'm going to do that. But that is the end of the secret doctrine of the Rosicrucians. And again, I know I skipped this part real fast. I feel so bad for doing that. But again, so close to the seven hermetic principles. So check that out. It's on my channel. Do a search. This is a playlist on the Kabbalion. Um, check it out. So I'm going to go take a piss right now and then I'm going to come back hang out in the comments with you guys and answer some questions so let's do that be right back Oh god damn. I completely missed that David David super chatted another $50. Jesus Christ. Thank you David. I complete I, my apologies. I completely I completely missed that. Wow. Thank you David. Let's send some What should we send for David? Let's do Infinity Skulls. I like the uh Infinity Skulls for David. Thank you again. My god David. Jeez. And she wolf she wolf. Honorable mention to Jordy. Thank you guys for helping us wake up the world so I'm gonna spend some time that is so we we did finish the secret doctrine of the Rosicrucians and again I, I know I skipped the end really fast but it was basically the same as the seven hermetic principles which we already looked at so go check it out if you want to see that um, But this stream was very, very important dealing with the main things that I want you guys to take away from this. Remember, the Rosicrucians' views on life after death are not exactly the same as ours. But the big takeaway here is that we are here to raise the consciousness of humanity up. To raise the consciousness of humanity up and to build this world into a place that is not something to escape from but to enjoy because it is perfectly optimized to fulfill our desires and lead to our mental optimization at the same time a perfect place for both play and learning experiencing and education that's what it's all about that's what we need to transform this world into from hell to heaven what book is next? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. We'll, we'll be starting a new book next Monday, though. That's exciting. New book next Monday. I'm, I'm certainly excited.
Wagon says, will we know our loved ones in the next life or do we just start all over again? Will we, will we be connected but is different? Well, like I said, it's very possible to form such very strong connections with another that you may reincarnate in a similar time and place as them. That's very possible. Is it guaranteed? No, but it's a possibility. But the important thing to know is that at the Omega point, we will all be reunited because we are all from the Abraxian perspective we are all one so we will all be united at the Omega point but in the meantime we're gonna have all these interplays of coming together coming apart meeting each other uh, breaks in between and whatnot so you know it's a story it's a, it's it's a story that unfolds <laughs> Ad Astra said Hegel no, we will not be reading Hegel. Just because <laughs> Hegel um, is so dense that I don't think anyone would watch the stream. It's just, I love Hegel. Hegel's fantastic. Hegel is one of my very favorite philosophers. But, uh, wow, Tr trying to read that live in such a way where people aren't bored to tears would would certainly be a challenge maybe someday maybe someday but but not today what are you saying jordan oh read something about thelema uh, well, hmm. I'll think about it. I'll think about it. Why is my, why am I, why is my face, why is this light? Is that better? Oh, that's much better, isn't it? I'm not glowing. I will consider it. Sometime in the future, I, I think that that would be good. Helen says, how do you stop praying to God after seeing the truth? There is an emptiness after realizing there's no one there. Well, you're there. We're there. So, you know, I mean, you don't need a God to pray to. You are all powerful. You have the potential to be all powerful, at least. And so I would highly recommend watching my videos on void states. I would highly recommend replacing prayer with void states because void states is all about you know at the end of void states we set our intentions for a personal goal but also a collective goal so it's something that all hyperians do so we need to replace god with ourselves and community because when we have when we have that community that's what fills up that hole because we do have that hole, but it's not something that you need to feel with jesus or something it's that we're all pieces of each other that are missing each other like, think of puzzle pieces. All puzzle pieces have holes in them, right? Well, we all fit together. We just are thrown into a world that doesn't let us fit together. That's why we're building this Hyperion community now, so we can start putting the puzzle pieces together. And that's what stepping into a Braxian consciousness is all about. And that's why we feel that, that those holes isn't the hole of, of Jesus. It's the holes that we have, for one thing, because we need to actualize ourselves but also because we, we we do we want that community we want that community we want to establish that connection yeah she wolf she wolf says you have you and us yes 100 percent david goddamn david another 50 dollars from david my god uh, thank you says always fun and and very interesting hanging out with you my friend and community very fulfilling overall good night mr b sign out love you all yes 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 david thank you hyperion mr beast out thank you david good lord yeah megan wingler says good lord david good lord what do you even i don't even know let's what what should we do let's do let's do a combo for david can we do some I'm going to do 
Can we do some combos? Just throw all the emojis at, at David at this point. Jeez. Jeez. Yes. <laughs> Just to get all the emojis for David. Hmm. Would love to hear your thoughts on some Wittgenstein. Yes, Wittgenstein would be fun. Maybe I know that there is a really good God series book. Oh, Goodell versus Wittgenstein. Goodell versus Wittgenstein would be fun. I think that would be a great read. That's 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 a really good one. Uh, I will good suggestion. I'll put that on my look at all those crazy emojis. I will uh, put that on a possibility. That's definitely a possibility. Goodell versus Wittgenstein is very possibly. All right, my friends, we should probably end this here. I'm thinking, uh, but this was a very important stream. I hope you uh, took away the important points from this, which I have said repeatedly, but I just to emphasize again, we are here to raise humanity up and we're not really, it's not, we're not trying to escape earth. We're trying to transform earth into the perfect place for us to uh, play and uh, learn desire and optimize all these things are necessary for our growth we can also i should do a video correspond you know corresponding with maslow's hierarchy of needs the expanded hierarchy is really helpful to understand all this here but yeah so good we have a video on free will coming out on wednesday if you didn't see my last video you missed the chicken nugget so make sure you watch my last video look forward to a new video on wednesday all about free will and a new book will be will begin next Monday, which I have yet to decide on. But so cool seeing you guys here. Big shout out to our moderators. Shout out to the moderators for making this a great environment. We had some trolls here today, but I saw they knocked them out of the park. So great job, guys. Uh, big shout out to our top contributors today, today. David, my God, thank you so much, David. And I know Claire and I believe Cynthia were some other big super chatters as well. Thank you everyone to super who super chats. That's how I'm able to do what I do. That's how I'm able to you know, get these videos to you and, and put the quality and editing into them that they are able to have. That's all because of you guys. So thank you so much. Thank you to everyone who likes and shares these videos. If you're on Facebook, please come on over to YouTube because Facebook is getting ridiculous lately. So YouTube is where it's at. Come on over. So good night, everyone. And I will see you all very, very soon. Until next time, Ad Astra to the stars.